just a bloke in a bar. What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to another episode of Bloke in a Bar. And you may be looking at my head and going, something's off here. And you no, know, look, the nose is the same size, but the background, it is different. The great Gypsy Tales podcast, podcast has allowed us to use a studio. Uh, so massive thanks to Gypsy Tales Podcast. If you're actually at Gypsy Tales Podcast on Instagram, give them a follow. They've got heaps of podcasts with all different people from all walks of life. They've got uh, heavy into like extreme sports, motor, motocross, but also had rugby league players on. Uh, really, really good stuff, guys. So that's G- uh, Gypsy Tales Podcast and also gypsy-tales.com is a website if you want to get any of their merch. But uh, it's a great day. It's a great day. I've got the omelette. The one, the only, Benny Hannon on the potty. What's going on, brother? Uh, Kempi, it's good to see you again. Good to see you back home, finally, on the Gold Coast, oh, mate. mate. We're it, both Mudrabar boys, which is 100. the west side of the highway yep, of country. the Gold Coast. Oh, yeah, it's country, <laughs> some, some would say. That's some where we say. first started out. You were doing soccer, I was doing rugby league. Yep. And we both ended up at the Broncos. How good. Mate. Like, it's just incredible. Now, two young Bron- uh, Mudgy boys doing, doing good in the world. Do, I mean, I think we're doing good. I, I don't know if we... I mean, some would say... I bring a lot of uh, shit content into the world, but look, as long as you're laughing at it, that's good. I with me or at me, it's not bad. I'm, I wouldn't say I'm bringing in crap, but I'm bringing a lot of kids in the world. At least I'm bringing the population <laughs> yes. up. For yeah, them. absolutely. Yeah, kids now, Take so. care of my pension when I'm older, hopefully, paying mm. taxes. <laughs> hopefully, someone's going to wipe my ass. I've done enough times for eight kids. <laughs> Holy eight kids! Okay, well let's just stop. Let's sort of stop right there. Eight kids, mate. Like that is a mammoth effort in many different ways you could look at it, but like. Was it always like almost a dream to have a big family? I come from a big family. I'm one of eleven, so I've got uh, six brothers and four sisters. Mm. That sort, I loved having a big family, but when it scared me, I didn't want to have that many kids. I actually, okay. wanted I wanted to be a footy player. I dreamt of it. Yeah. And as it got closer for me, I thought, you know, what? I don't want to get married. I want to party, have a good time, yeah. and you know, just just enjoy the be lifestyle. A young bloke. Being a footy player yeah. brings. But I met. A really good girl when I was 15. Mm. Wouldn't date me till I was 16. She wouldn't didn't want to date till 16. My wife now, Emma. Yeah. And um, yeah, became best friends. Started dating at 16. Yeah. And uh, sure enough, got I think I got engaged at like 18 or 19. Oh, really? Got married at 20. And yeah. Was she also like really keen for big family? Like, is, is that something she was initially, or did she see how much you loved the, you know, your family and the, the big, the nature of how big it is? Come on, Kempi, I'm married. You're married, aren't you? Like, you don't get to pick and choose. You do oh yeah. You're told my missus. We wanted one. She had one. Said, let's have two. I was like, okay, we'll have two. And then yep. she's like, okay, we can handle two. Let's go to three. Let's go to four. Yep. And the, the so it's like a gradual thing for her. Yeah, pretty much. That's how I didn't plan to have eight kids. But oh really? To be honest okay. with you, if I had more time and you know if pregnancy wasn't so hard for her mm. you know i'd have another eight if i could like it's just no way like you can't take your money with you down the track yeah your legacy you're going to leave one day is how you raise your kids mm. and i'm excited to you know when i get older see my kids and grandkids do great things in this world mm. yeah it's uh it's interesting as you get older like these like for me anyway obviously you started quite young but like when i was younger i was always like i don't know if i want kids or whatever but yeah, you maybe as- shouldn't <laughs> no, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, if they get this beat. Can you have kids? This is a does cursor. It, does it work? Can um, you, does it, does it... Oh, does it work? Look, if there's one thing that works, there's a little it's cap that. gun. Bang, bang, Look, there's a lot of place. things going wrong in my life. That's not it. It's not a cap gun. Okay. It's not, also not a shotgun. <laughs> Somewhere in between. <laughs> Somewhere in between. Um, now, yeah, so like as I get older, I, I start to think about exactly what you said, like legacy and like also when I'm 50, 60 years old, like I want a fucking family to be able to come home to. I don't want to roll into an empty house and it's, it's almost like what we're put on this earth to do, to be to be honest. And I love being a young dad too. It's been really cool because my whole journey of playing footy, my kids got to be on the field after the games yeah, and the yeah. wins. When we won the comp in 2015, yeah. I had six of my kids there on the field holding the trophy and That's walking so around that field. Yeah. And what they said to me around that field was, now, that's probably the, the best highlight of my whole footy career. It wasn't mm. what I was what done on the field. It was the way that my kids were looking at me and talking me after. And that's, I think most parents, when you speak to anyone, they talk about their kids, the highlight in their lives is seeing them achieve great things and seeing them. Yeah. As, as a dad, I think your, your role is to try and be your kid's hero and they look up and yep. you set a good example for them. Mate, yeah. Eight kids. Wow, incredible. Incredible stuff. So that means like, I wonder what the math would be. So obviously your parents had 11 kids. Yep. So, like, the Hannett family... Do you want to know how many grandkids my parents have got now? Yeah, yeah. 61. 61! 61. 61. So, they were pushing to get 60. They yeah. wanted, desperately want to get 60. So, my little brother, Ephraim, who was a professional swimmer for Australia, yep. they kept pressuring him because he was the youngest. He had, <laughs> at this stage, four girls. 
Four girls. Okay. Real men make men. He's not a real man. He can't make men. So he's got four girls. My mum's been peppering him. Yeah. I want the 60th grandchild. You're the one. You'll be my favorite son if you give him my 60th grandchild. Convinced his wife eventually, finally, yeah. about six months later, he knocks up his missus. And they don't know what it is. And they're hoping that they get a boy. Fifth kid's going to be a boy. Yeah. And they got all excited and they rung mum and dad up and told them, guess what? We're giving you your 60th grandchild. <laughs> And mum and dad were real quiet. And he's like, I didn't know how to take it because I thought they'd be excited. Yeah. I'm like, oh, sorry, but your older sister got knocked up. So oh, actually your child, no. your kid's now 61. Oh. So, and then on top of that, so that week they found out that they weren't number 60. They didn't really have to go again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they had the 61st grandchild. And on top of that, they did a gender reveal. Yeah. Baby number five. Not a little girl. No way. So he's got five girls. Five and girls. I don't know if he's going again, but if he does, <laughs> mate, we've got fingers, toes, everything crossed for him. Oh, if he has a boy. wow. That's crazy. So 61. What's mm. like, do you have to hire out a whole town hall for Christmas? So Mudrabah Hall. Yeah, where we grew up in Mudrabah. <laughs> At Christmas time, every second year is a Hannity year. For the last four or five Christmases, yeah. we hire the Mudrabah Hall and the. <laughs> it's like the pony club. It's got the big ovals. You got is everyone born? Castle. Most of them. <laughs> so just like all blonde heads from the top that's yeah, yeah. just uh, dabbled through his well, like the Von Traps, mate. We make our own clothes, we sing, we dance, all the good stuff. Yeah. Oh, it's pretty right. much what you're thinking, 61. that's what it is. That's incredible, man. That's incredible. Um, but yeah, what are you been up to lately? Obviously, you've got your radio gig. How's that going? You enjoying it? All that kind of stuff? Yeah, so obviously retired from footy now. I've been retired six years. So mm. I moved, I retired from footy to do breakfast radio on the Gold Coast. Mm. So six to nine, Monday to Friday at CFM, which mm. we grew up listening to. Yes, back absolutely. In the day. And uh, so now that's my job doing that and commentating footy on the weekend for Triple M. Mm. So Is that still 90.9? 90.9, yes. Yeah. Bro, yeah, that's childhood memories yeah. there, bro. And I've, I have i haven't been in, living on the Gold Coast for ages. So that's, yeah, Monday to Friday, do that six to nine. And mm. then uh, weekend now that the Dolphins are in as well. So I call all the Broncos games, yep. normally a Sydney game as well. Yep. Is that for Triple M, did you say? Triple M, yep. yeah. So with um, Ben Dobbin, Gordon Tallis, mm. and Benny Tio is doing a fair bit yep. of that. And uh, Andy Raymond also. So oh, the great Andy Raymond. Yeah, so he, now with the Dolphins are in as well, we'll be going probably to two games to maybe three games a week. Oh, really? So I'm, I'm enjoying that. I'm still yeah. involved in the game. Mm. We love the game, so it's it's just great to be able to still be a little bit a part of it. What's been it like? Like, what's it been like? You know, you're in media now. Like, you're a media guy, and like never would have picked it. Yeah. We 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 both know. Like, when you're playing rugby league, it's not like you don't dislike the media because you understand they're just people doing their job but there is oh a, you fear them you fear them to a degree is it oh, just a are, war you gotta admit like coming through you were scared to speak to the media because it's 100%. not what you're worried what the media would say about you or what mm. they'd put what they would play mm. but you're more worried about what your teammates and coaches will say if you try to go outside that box oh, or bro. say something give the opposition ammo like yeah. you're constantly every second thinking about what you're saying and yep. that's why so many boys struggle speaking to the media because they don't want to give the opposition any ammo yeah. but also your teammates any ammo because if you say something <sighs> You will cop it. Like, cop it, cop it. But the great thing about rugby league players is is what you learn about what goes behind <laughs> the curtains. Mm. It's what we do behind the scenes where we're out and having fun partying and we're in the sauna mm. telling stories of what went down after the game, what went down on the weekend. Yeah. No one tells better stories than footy boys. Like, <laughs> yeah. I, I, the reason I've got my job now is because I listened. It wasn't me. Yeah. I was quiet as anything. And <laughs> I was just listening and learning yep. how the boys tell stories. Because if you tell the bad story, oh. mate, you copped it. Tell you, well, you, you're halfway through the story and you hear this boring. Yeah, blokes yawning. Yeah. Shut up. Fucking shit story, yeah, bro. Exactly what it is. <laughs> you get so crushed. That way you, you learn to add a bit of GST, a bit of <laughs> yeah. mayo as well. And that's exactly what you need in the media, yeah. media is have a personality. Yeah know how to tell a story and, mm. and it's every now and again add a bit of GST to yep. it, sprinkle a little bit of mayo Jazz it up top. a bit, you know? Yeah, a bit of, bit of salt and pepper. <laughs> and so, like, yeah, obviously you've, you've been doing it for three or four years now, which I maybe even longer. Six years, yeah, I've been retired oh, so six you went, years. So you went straight into... So the, I retired like, from footy for this gig. Mm. So oh, I used okay. to do it when I was up at the Cowboys. Yep. Just, I would just go in and do a segment. Mm. The reason why I got my job was mm. because I've always tried to have a second job my whole footy career. When I was yeah. at the Roosters, I worked getting the money out of the pokies. Mm. When I was at the Broncos, I worked at the Rockley Markets, throwing food around, mm. food around from one a.m. till about eight a.m. in was the morning. Was that uh, Sammy Thai did some stuff there? Is uh, that the same I, markets? I, not, he may have done a little bit there, okay. but I used to work with Tony Joseph there. But okay, yep. Two thousand six, when we won the grand final, mm. I'd go to work. So I'd leave the Gold Coast at twelve o'clock at night, mm. start work at one a.m. in Brisbane, mm. work all day through till seven thirty, eight o'clock in the morning, and then drive to first grade training. <laughs> Even grand final week, I, I still went that. to the markets. Oh, my God, Because bro. it's part of my routine. Yeah, that yeah. really taught me how, if you want something, mm. 
you, you go after it and get it. Yeah. You know, that was a really good year for me, that one. Oh, but yeah. I've always worked two jobs. And so when I went to the Cowboys, they needed someone to go in for free mm. and just do a wrap up of what went down. And I said, I'm sick of the same boring answers, mm. same questions asked. Yeah. Can, I, can I bring a teammate with me and let's have some fun? Mm. Let's pull the curtain back and tell some stories yeah. of what went down on the weekend or, or different things that happened. So mm. give you an example, like big Jason Tamalolo, $10 million player, mm. champion, one of my great mates, he's mm. a top bloke. But people think he's this big, tough, serious bloke. Yeah, yeah. Grand final week, he was chasing Pokemon down in Sydney, <laughs> trying to f find Charmanders or whatever the hell they are. <laughs> On his phone, yeah, 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 yeah. He's just a big kid. He plays yeah. Halo against kids. He's, <clears throat> I think he paid thousands of dollars buying other people's accounts. Like People don't know that about him, so yeah. I'd take the piss out of him at that. But at the yeah. same time, he'd have MO from something I've done that week, yeah. and he'd take it out on me. And mm. so our fans got to see what we're really like, not just the footy side of us, but seeing the fun and the boys actually really enjoyed doing it. So they mm. actually asked me, can I come in again? Oh, really? Yeah, good, good. And they loved it. And yep. now Kyle Felt's doing it up there. Oh, yeah, seen that and, actually. Um, yep. So that, that's going really well for him. And mm. from that, they asked me to come to, to Brisbane and do a demo. Yeah. And a demo for radio is you just go in and tell a couple of stories mm. with a couple of other people. Yeah. I didn't think anything of it. Yeah. Told a couple of stories. And I was like, this is fun. This is easy. Went back. I signed to keep playing with the Cowboys. Mm. It's about to start preseason. Two weeks later, they get a phone call saying, "What would it take for you to hang the boots up and do oh, this right. full time?" So, oh, right. I had a decision to make. Yeah, and I thought really hard about it, but my wife goes, "Mate, what are you doing? You idiot! You're getting old. You're 31. You've done everything Your body's in the falling game. Apart. There's nothing like, more to check off for you. You've done everything. Let's let's go and do something different. Yeah. So, started wow. doing it. Yeah, I can't read. I can't write. I'm dyslexic. No way. And I never spoke like you knew me growing up. I was yeah. pretty quiet. Mm. I mean, we both were when we come into grade. Yeah, well, you had to be because, mate, you spoke <laughs> oh, up, you got shit. slim. Holy so shit. So for, for me, learning the, the tools of my trade, the footy helped me out to yep. then mm. to, to transition to radio. So yeah, then well, I yeah. hung the boots up and now I've been doing it six years later. So so you've got, obviously, the breakfast show. What I've always wanted to know with a breakfast show is like, usually in the good ones, it seems like these are all like close mates. I'm not asking you, are oh, you mates or whatever, but like, how do you build that chemistry so quickly? It's crucial too. Yeah, so yeah. chemistry is really important because mm. you got to be real. It's it's one of the. It's even more. You got to be more connected than what you are as a football player. Because mm. footy players, you're not waking up on each other straight away first thing in the morning. Yeah. You, know, you have your own time. You're mm. together and you go away, whatever it may be. Mm. But breakfast radio, you could have had a bad night of whatever's happened. Yeah. But then you got to come and perform, and you got to be together. And you've got to be able to have fun, take the piss out of each other, know when to give them a cuddle, know when to have a go at them, yeah. all the different things. Yeah. So it's it's like a relationship mm. and it's it's one of those things you've got to massage and mm. it's something that I've, I've definitely, it's I've really enjoyed it, but yeah. at times you definitely find it difficult because in footy, there's just one way and that's it. Yeah, you, yeah. There's, there's rules, you stick to it, no matter how you're feeling, you cross that line when you get mm. on that field, you perform. Yeah. Whereas radio is very different very to that. Different. Whereas... I feel yeah. like footy too, if you've got a problem with someone, you just, mate, that was fucking shit. Oh, you can't do that. Mate, Whereas obviously in radio, you can't do I that. I didn't realize this. I had no idea about this when I changed jobs. Yeah. In footy, I didn't know there was no HR. No. There's no workplace health and safety. No. So as I came to radio, does he see like, what, you can't say that? What, why is there tape on the ground? Like if a carpet bit was sticking up, yeah, there'd be yeah. someone there watching it and monitoring it. Like, <laughs> Dude, just step over it. Like, what's the big deal? But there's a whole other world yeah, it's out there. a different world, where, bro. Yep. It's not footy is ruthless and cutthroat. So many times you've had coaches call you every name under the oh, sun mate. and accuse you and have a go. Sometimes fair, sometimes not. Yep. But you learn to cop it sweet and yeah. realize what are the, not what they're saying to me. Mm. It's more why are they saying Absolutely. that to me? What are yeah. they trying to teach me? Yep. Where in the real world, people aren't ready for the footy side oh, of bro. Yeah. That's It's something like, you know, running my, I think we've got like nearly 12 employees now. And so like running my company, it's something that like I have to learn as well. Like you can't just be harsh to people like in rugby league that where it's like you're all kind of extreme achievers and everyone can kind of get where you're coming from. Some people need to be massaged into it and understand what the process is and calm and everything. So it's definitely, it's, it's a huge culture shock for sure. And I don't know what the best way is. It's just different. And footy is changing as well. I think footy's oh, gone yeah, that way massively. more now as well where yeah. I think we're massaging a lot of different people's personalities as mm, well. Mm. I know I spoke to, when I was doing the boxing fight against, um, who was it? Just recently, Paul Gallon. Oh, yep. I went down to Jeff Fennick's house mm. and all of a sudden after I finished training, there's Graham Arnold. The Socceroos coach yeah, yeah, where? rocks up and starts chatting with me and we sat down and all three of us having a good old chat. Mm. And he's the exact same thing that he's struggling with the Socceroos is how to give critis um, feedback or constructive criticism mm. 
where they could take it if people around they couldn't do it and what are all the different situations mm. where I think in every sport in every part of society now I think that's the big challenge for yeah, everyone is it's a new how to get the best out of everyone without upsetting feelings and yeah all those things where feelings didn't matter back when we were playing. It was just uh, it was, we win or we don't win. Or, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah or absolutely. Um, mate, they're, yeah, incredible to see what you've done on the radio, and just like again, it's it's been on what six years in, on on the on the radio. Yep, That's pretty long for a radio show, bro. I've got another another year. Yep, so it'll be seven years. Far out. This year and we'll, we'll see what happens after no, that. That's but, awesome, bro. No, I love it, and I I like the challenge. Like I said, I. I can't read. So when I'm doing live like live reads it's or live. anything like that, it's, <laughs> we're going live. The pressure's on, but yeah. it's it's a good challenge. Do I make mistakes? Yes, I do. Is it funny? Of course, it is at times. <laughs> it's part of the charm. Exactly. So <laughs> it's it's one of those things I'm enjoying and, and making the most of. So take us back to a, a young fella. Um, now look on Wiki, it's got your nickname Polar Bear, and I just want to say that's incorrect. Your nickname's the Omelette. Yeah, but that's, most people don't know the omelet. But uh, that's the true. That's the Broncos. That's the, the Broncos true. That's that. the true yeah. nature. I mean, I feel like that's the closest nickname. Yeah. <laughs> polar, polar, you know, polar bear is your public facing nickname. Mm. <laughs> um, but anyway, so grew up obviously on the Goldie. Yep. The beautiful, beautiful suburb of Madurai. Um, You know, was it always rugby league? Did you do other sports? What was it like growing up? I, I did all sports growing up. Oh, at school, when mm. at high school, I went to Palm Beach Crumman High School. Yep. It's a sporting school. So I, yep. instead of doing schoolwork, I struggled with school. So mm. I picked every sport. It was water polo. I actually, my first time ever representing our country was actually for athletics. Could no you, way. Could you guess what, what I would have represented Shop Australia for? No. Discus. No. Keep going. Uh, Get more creative. Javelin. Keep going. The walk. On. No. Uh, decathlon. Keep going. <laughs> Long jump. Triple no. jump. Pole vault. Pole vault. Oh, so I was no. Queensland. I, I don't believe First you. time I ever went on an airplane. The omelet's not getting up there. I swear to you on my life. Oh, first I time I it. ever went on an <laughs> airplane in my life wasn't for footy. It was to rep- go to the Australia at the at uh, the Olympic Stadium in Sydney. Yeah. This is before the Olympics. This Pole is 1999. I went down there and represented. I broke the state record. I held the, <laughs> held the state record. Went down there to nationals. I got fourth at nationals and made the Pan Pax team. I didn't go to Pan Pax. You didn't go to Pan Pax? My first time ever. Yeah, you know, no so I did way. all sports. I constantly did. Were you everything. graceful with the pole vault, the oh, big omelet? Well, I got to do it for a year and a half, and then I got too big for the pole. They didn't have a pole. Big enough <laughs> I was going to say me, the so big fella. Wow, so it could have been Steve Hooker. That could have been me, mate. The okay. Olympics. Do you uh, still get an itch to get back in the pole vault scene? I get, mate. It's scary. Cause how many times I went up. I'm a big lad. I wasn't as you like. You were quick. You could run up to forty kilometers an hour. Oh yeah, I was fucking yeah, light. Like, though. Have a break. You're, I mean, you're fast. I was close to forty k. Ten meters per second, whatever. But whatever. But so my thing, I, you know, I thought I could run pretty quick. But the big thing is, you got to be able to get up and up technique and mm. get past the horizontal, mm. the vertical. Sorry, to get yep. over. And so many times I went up, so I'm up four four plus meters in the air as a kid, and I'd fall straight back down on, the, and I've snapped poles as well and all the good no, stuff. But it, I it was a lot of fun. Ball, bro. So no, I always did all the sports. Yeah. But growing up, I wanted to be like my older brothers. So mm. I've got uh, six brothers. Mm. A lot of them are older than me. They all love their rugby league, and I always looked up to them. I think as kids, you look up to your dad. You want to be like For your sure. dad. Your dad's your hero. Yeah. But I actually believe you look up more to your older brothers because mm. they're more closer to you, and they're doing stuff already that you want to do. And you want to be with them and exactly. hang out with you them look, and all that so kind of stuff. They were probably even more my role models and blokes I looked up to with my older brothers. And they mm. were playing rugby league at the time. and mm. So in the backyard, I started doing that, and that that became I started watching TV and seeing the Canberra Raiders go around, and then mm. was the, the Raiders Broncos, your team? The Raiders were before the Bronx, yep. but then when the Bronx came in, like the Raiders were the big deal, and the yeah. Bronx came in as well. Yeah, it was Raiders Broncos. Mm. And Willie mm. Kahn was the man for me back yep. in the day. I love watching him on the wing for the Bronx. But yeah, that that's what I loved, and that's yeah. what I wanted to pursue being a footy player. Did you did you excel straight away? Nah. Or take your time. No, I was terrible. Really, I was a fat kid. Like I'm still like looking at me now. I'm a mess. I love me food, mate. But you're was... the fittest big fella ever. Yeah, Seriously, I'm a, I'm a fat athlete. Thank you. Appreciate <laughs> it. Big fella. So. Politically correct. Growing up, I never made a rep team properly until I was 17. Mm. And I got, that was default I even made that. Mm. So I used to go to the rep trials. I always wanted to be a you know footy player. But and I remember going after them, not making rep teams. I'd come home to mum and yeah. having a little silk. Like, why can't it be me? Why not me? And she's like, well, what are you doing more than them? Mm. Like, you know, these guys, they're talented. Yeah. But if you want to be as good as them, you can actually have, you can have to do something. You're going to work harder. You yeah. may want it. Everyone wants a million dollars. Yeah. Not everyone's going to get it. Absolutely. You got to work for it. And mm. it might come easy to some people, but if you work hard, it'll come to you. Mm. So that sort of changed my mindset. And one big thing that really changed my life forever, and it was actually, I was playing for the Palm Beach Crumman school team, year 10, I think it was. Mm. 
and I'm playing my year grade. So I got kept down. So I was at the older age of the year group. Yep. And I made the Broncos elite squad. So Semi Thido was there. Neville yeah. Costigan was there. There was oh, a whole wow. heap of players yeah. that went. And I thought I had made it. Because yeah. I never, I got hand-me-down clothes. Well, I was a poor kid, all that sort of stuff. Yep. And so I got the Broncos kit. And I remember sitting there in that room. We were doing a camp. It was like a three or four-day camp. Mm. I'm like, I've made it. How awesome is this? And then comes the long neck. Wayne Bennett walks in the room. Skeletal. Six foot five, however tall. I made the, the godfather rang. But I remember just looking at him. <laughs> like, so what's he going to say? Yep. First, he, he doesn't smile at all. Like, typically what you yeah. see in the media. And we know that's not what he's like. Yeah. But he's trying to skit now. And the kids young, all rattled yeah, on that. Yeah. Rattle us. First thing he said was, don't get comfortable, boys. <laughs> now, this whole group, only one of you are going to make it. Oh. I just remember looking around the room, seeing my other blokes. I'm like, it ain't going to be me. <laughs> I'm thinking, crap, like, is this legit? And we started yeah. doing fitness, skills, agility, all the tests. Mm. I was the bottom end. Mm. I was trying wow. my ass off, but I was the bottom it's like end. like fitness is your thing Fitness, now. I was a higher than most, but it was yeah. like, we're talking about those backs and skinny dudes. Yeah. Like, I was a chubby little kid. I never yeah. did weights before. I didn't, I, I would have been probably 16 years of age. Mm. And that by the end of the camp, I realized, when I was going, I was playing it out in my head, what am I going to say to my parents and my brothers and sisters when they asked me about this? Like, how do I talk myself up? Like, I did good. Yeah. But deep down, I just knew my career was over. I'd yeah, never wow. be a football player or any of that. No I was thinking about that and then I was getting feeling pretty down on myself. Mm. And it came to the last night before we were leaving and Wayne Bennett pulled us all in to have a chat to us all. And he said a lot of things that night, but there's one thing that stood out and changed my life forever. Mm. He said lots of different things, but he said, boys... There's no one better than you, but you're no better than anyone else. He goes, I'll repeat that. Mm. I know when someone repeats, it's important. He said, there mm. is no one better than you, mm. but you're no better than anyone else. And I couldn't stop thinking about that. I went back to my dorm. I couldn't sleep. I constantly was thinking about that saying, mm. like, what does it mean? I didn't understand it. Finally, I couldn't sleep. It finally hit me. I realized I can be better than anyone. I can be the best in the world at whatever I want. Mm. But everyone else has the exact same opportunity. Everyone has greatness in them. Mm. What are they willing to do? Are they willing to sacrifice? Are they willing to work harder? You might be fitter than me. Mm. I might have to do three times the amount of fitness to catch up to you. Well, that means I'm going to have to do four times the amount of training, but I will be better than you. Mm. But also taught me to be humble and realize I'm no better than anyone else. Everyone has greatness in them. I mm. help unlock their greatness. Mm. If I see something they're doing that I like, I make sure I copy that and do some more because that's mm. what I need to do if I want to achieve what I want to achieve. Mm. And I started to do that. I went home after that camp, I started doing push-ups and sit-ups every night and mm. running extra on top of all the other training, but everyone, everyone else was doing their normal training. I'd do extra. Yeah. And within the space, I thought it took forever and it didn't happen. Within the space of 12 months, I made my first Queensland team playing before the state of origin, playing no against Sonny Bill Williams, all those sort of guys. Yeah. Just playing for New South Wales back in the day. <clears throat> The following year, making Australian schoolboys, touring England and France with Australia, wow. signed by the Bronx, and just went on from there, from yeah. just realizing that we all have greatness in us. Mm. Everyone does. It doesn't have to always be football, mm. but if you want to unlock that greatness, you have to do something for it. Yeah, for and sure. That, that's something that really made me reach my potential in the footy field, mm. but also being a husband, being a father, mm. and now doing radio as well. Yeah, it's, uh, it's so interesting, those elite camps like, What's crazy is I remember a specific saying by Ivan Henjak that like still haunts me to this day and it was uh, bad habits are like a good bed, easy to get into, hard to get out of. Mm. And ever since that day, I'm like, every time I see myself like mentally switching off or taking an easy route or yep. saying today's not the day or whatever, I think of that saying and yep. go, this is one of those situations where we get into a bad habit. Um, look at us now, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, clearly, we're in a bad habit. Clearly, we didn't listen to Ivan Hedjak. I'm great in other areas of my life. Yeah. I'm great in other areas of my life. Um, but it's such a good point. Like, so many people, they see, especially with the internet now, it's so accessible to see success, but there's always a price you have to pay. Mm. Sometimes that price isn't even worth it. Like, it's some, there's some, some success, the price isn't worth it. Or, or for example, the million bucks. It, it seems absurd to say, but there is a price to pay for a million dollars. But the key is people that want that million dollars, when they get there, mm. they don't go, oh, this million dollars is fantastic. This mm. is the greatest thing ever. Mm. You look back, it's a journey. Yeah. The, the, the whole fun and the exciting and what you cherish, mm. like winning a grand final, that's cool. The day was amazing. Yeah. But the whole 12 months lead, the four years leading up yeah. to that as a team or how many years we were together mm. to get there. The blood, sweat, the tears. I will never trade that. I'd rather trade in that day for that four years yeah. that got us that outcome. So it's, it's not so just true. that end result. Mm. It's a journey along the way and the things you learn together on the way. Mm. Like another one of those sayings I live by is, it's even an ad, from little things, big things grow. Mm. Now in footy, if you start 
if you do the little things right, when I played for Queensland and for Australia, mm. the reason what made Jonathan Thurston, Cameron Smith, Billy Slater so good mm. is they did the basics better than anyone. Yeah, well, they yeah. worked on it hard. And my first training session with the Queensland team, I rocked up. I was early to it. I thought I was, I was like 15 minutes early. I thought I was late. Everyone was already out in the field doing extras yeah. before. That's the reason those blokes are going to be immortals one day and legends. Yeah. They taught me, and it wasn't they were doing chip and chasing <clears throat> and the fancy stuff. Mm. They're doing the stuff you hate doing. The yeah. stuff when you're a kid going, why are we doing this stuff? Yep. These are the elite guys. They're doing the little things right because you do the little things turn to big. You do the little things right, turn to big successes and great outcomes. Yeah. You start making excuses, lying, cheating, whatever it may be in your life, mm. making excuses, blaming others is another big one. Mm turn to big mistakes and big failures and, and blaming yeah. others. Accountability so, is a, a that's huge, what, huge thing. That's the huge thing I learned from rugby league and mm. from watching. One thing I was big on was I wasn't very talented. Mm. I watched everyone around me, good and bad, mm. and, and learned so much along the way. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So just before you went to the elite camp, you said you, you struggled a bit financially as a family. Mm. Was that hard? Because like it's one thing to struggle with three or four kids. It's another thing to struggle with 11 kids. That was embarrassing. It was what was it like? Oh, it was so embarrassing. Mm. And I don't want to cry poor. Like I wouldn't change it for anything because yeah. it made me who I am today. Absolutely. I love it. And I laugh at the stories now. Mm. So when I was about eight years of age, my parents lost everything. So my mm. dad had a really successful business. So my older brothers who were like 15 years older than me, 20 mm. years older than me, mm. all got nice cars driving to school. Dad had a very successful business. Mm. But when the recession they had to have in the 90s, dad did all this work and no one everyone declared bankrupt and didn't oh. pay him so he had the choice he could hide money as well and not yeah. pay his staff yep. he decided to pay his staff but right. we lost yeah. everything yeah. so we lived in a tent in our next door neighbor's yard for a fair few weeks before we could find wow. a two-bedroom place in the rain which is a rough used to be a used really be rough tough. area yeah. i remember yeah. my next door neighbors one just got out of prison one was just about to go into yeah. prison yep absolutely it was a really tough. really rough yep. area and we were, i was sleeping my bunk bed and I was, you know, the six of us boys in the room. Mm. My bunk bed was, the, I had to squeeze between the roof and, oh, and in summer, no air con, the heat. Oh, I, mean, I was, I was a big, big, the, oh, the big, moisture, big boy. The, the, the <laughs> Kineston cream that was needed for rashage just that to sleep. The smell of that room but, would have been fucking. Oh, mate. The, it's mum, dad slept in the laundry. So we lost everything. And, you know, as a family, it, it, it can break families up, financial difficulties. But mm. for us, it brought us close together and we learned to rely on each other and help out. And mm. we all worked and I couldn't play footy. Mum, dad couldn't oh, even yeah. afford to sign off for footy. So I remember it killed me that year, seeing my mates go on a footy and I had to walk home mm. and not be able to participate. So I'd, I realized if I want something, the the person stopping me is going to be me moving yeah. forward. Mm. So I started knocking on doors through Mudgebo and Penogan Road through Mudgebo yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. I'd ask them, can I mow your lawns? Can I wash your car? Can I do anything for five bucks, wow. two bucks, whatever it was? And I ended up making a couple hundred bucks yeah. in that 12 month period. It wasn't, I worked my bum off. Yeah. They bought my, my school textbooks and stuff for school mm. and a sign on for the Mudjabar Redbacks. And I the used Red to borrow Bucks. boots from the lost property. No way. Footy and it was embarrassing. We didn't have a car, mm. so our, our friends lent us this crappy old ute mm. that the battery was flat in it. So <laughs> going to school, this is how embarrassing. Like there's 11 of us kids. Yeah. So we had a ute that had a tarp over the back. Oh. And so if mum and dad turned the car off to save petrol, which they did constantly because yeah. we had no money, yeah. you'd have to push start the car. So you think all of us kids out the front of school, <sighs> Mudrabar State School, Primary School, in hand-me-down clothes, holes in the shoes, pushing a ute to jump start, and then climbing in the back. <laughs> and the last person, the oldest kid who sat in the front with mum, got to tie the tarp down so the cops couldn't see us. Like, <laughs> oh my that's God. how embarrassing. And all my mates at school could see that. And Holy. so they go to church dressing in Sunday best with a tie up, lying down underneath, rolling in the back when they go around roundabouts. <laughs> no That's what way. I did. But I wouldn't change for the world because it taught me mm. that you don't need money in life. And mm. if you want something, anything mm. stopping you from achieving or or if you need something, or every, bad stuff's going to happen to everyone. It's mm. how you handle those bad situations. Mm. And that brought our family close together, but that made me realize I wanted to not be that way. And yeah. it made me realize... You, you got to work hard. Yeah, you got, you got to put more effort in, and yeah, yeah that that was wow. that was my childhood. And oh man, so many memories of embarrassment and different things where I shook my head and can't believe this 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 is the worst thing ever in my life. Sucks. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah, looking back now, I, I love it. I yeah. love that I had that mm. because I haven't been handicapped 
because a lot of kids now, and my kids included, mm. we constantly do everything for them. We give mm. them everything. Yeah. They don't appreciate it. They don't yeah. know how to earn it. They don't know how to do it themselves. They expect it. Mm. So this is, for me, that taught me everything I needed to know to be the best husband and father I can be for my kids. It's funny how, like, you know, having a children in an environment that, you know, you, you've obviously been successful in life. It's a good environment. And sometimes it's almost a handicap because mm. they don't have to, they don't learn to fight at a young age. Whereas like, if you grow up like, you know, obviously I wasn't struggling that much, but I had hand-me-downs all growing mm. up. You know, we used to put our feet in a thing called Condi's Crystals. Like we were obviously state runners and that and on Tartan. And our parents used to like tell us, oh no, you're actually not big enough to wear spikes yet. But it was because we couldn't afford spikes. Oh, yeah. So you, there's literally pictures of us like winning state titles where everyone else was wearing spikes on Tartan. And our feet are like all purple and taped up because we were running in bare feet on Tartan. Um, and and if you look back at that, I bet you don't regret that one. I love day. it. It's made you tougher. hundred percent. And that's what we got to realize. Parents will be like, we're not going to do that to our kids. Mm. But that's what made us who we are. Mm. And that's the big thing I've got to keep reminding myself with my kids is my kids, you get nothing for nothing. Mm. My big thing is anything worthwhile. Is, like you got to work, you got to work to get anything. If you want something, you got to get, you can yep. get after it. Absolutely. So. And it's, yeah, it's, it's almost got to be taught as a, as a young age because when you get, you know, in your late teens, so it might be too late. Like you got, you got to dig, like, for example, your first preseason, you got to find some fire in you that that's, I think started from a young age. The guys that try and put it on later on in their, their teenage years, it, it can be, it can be built up for sure. I'm not saying that, but there's certain types of people that they just have it in them from a young age kind of thing, that fight. But the key is you got to want it. The, mm. the, and, and if you want it bad enough, you'll be willing to. And the key is that the reason why so many rugby league players come from tough break, uh, backgrounds, mm. broken homes, poor families, is because if life was easy, you wouldn't do what we had to do. No. You wouldn't go through the pain, no. the hurt, the fitness, the all the different, the wrestling, all the different things along the way. If life was easy, you'd say, oh, this same for me. I don't need this. Yeah, well, I don't I'm need doing this. fine without it. Yeah. But the people, it's same like, the best surfers and bull riders come out of Brazil. Yeah. The most most countries, you know, Russia and that's the best fighters come out of Russia. Like it's mm. people who come from tough backgrounds are the ones who want it the most, and mm. they they're willing to sacrifice. If you so the kids, if you want something bad enough, you you've got to be willing to to do anything to yeah, get it. Absolutely, absolutely. And so okay, so you get the elite squad. Then after that, when did you get offered the contract for Broncos? And also, did you go straight into first grade squad out of school? No, no, I didn't. Okay. So, Cyril. Cyril the Connell, the Cyril great. He, he scouted me as well. The champion. Mm. Like he, he, to me, like, I remember him coming and sitting with my parents mm. and just his mannerism, how he was. Like, he is the man for the Brisbane. Like, the, if you look for recruiting yeah. for the Broncos, he will. There's an argument. Be. There's an argument to be said that the Broncos' slow decline has been ever since Cyril Connell has not been there. You could make the argument. Well, him and Wayne Bennett together, yeah, were, together. were unstoppable. Those yeah. two, the way that they went about recruiting mm. young kids, it wasn't just what they could do on the field, it was how they carried themselves around mm. their family, yep. at the school area, all the different things all added into the decisions that Cyril made. Yeah. Cyril actually got me my first job when I went to the Bronx. I was 17 when I moved to Brisbane. Mm. I, I was supposed to play just Colts. Yeah. And I ended up playing Queensland Cup the whole year. So I worked oh, no really way. hard. And so so you, were you training with the Clydes? So I trained. So I started off at the Colts doing preseason. Yep. Which we got to see the first grade NRL players like Gordon Tallis. Who I oh, you got up. to see them? All those guys wow. training. We trained to this the side of them. 2002, 2003? This is 2003. 2003. Yeah, first year out of school. So I graduated wow. 2002. And that was amazing just to being in their presence. And actually my first ever nickname I got was from Gordon Tallis. What was it? <laughs> Nick Nolte. Nick Nolte. <laughs> Nick Nolte was the first one. Gary Busey was probably another one as well. But around that time when I first went there as a young kid, I was just stoked. He yeah. stoked me. I remember he was driving a Monaro at the time. Yeah. The boots, his Nike boots is where I'm like, man, I want to be like him when I get Guess what my first nickname was from, remember Stuart Kelly? Yeah, what was it? Skirt. <laughs> oh, yes. Denim skirt. Yeah, 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 so they were yeah, like, oh, he's yeah. skirt. Oh, he's skirt. And I was like, oh, please don't stick around. And then That's when that sticks. generation all retired, yeah. oh, I just buried it i didn't tell yeah. anyone that that was a nickname and then it just went away yeah you can't bury nick it's coming back <laughs> no, you back skirt Mate, that'll be your next shirt you get done up. yeah yeah skirt. you can't pick him but it was it was one of those things that training as a young kid i was being around those guys it made me work even harder because I, I was always know that my parents taught me mm. when you think no one's watching there's always someone's yeah. always watching so yeah. i made sure i performed at training i did everything i could an mm. opportunity came up kevy walters was the coach of queensland cup mm. And uh, yeah, after doing the preseason, I went up and 
played that year in Queensland Cup. And my first ever game yeah. was against the Redcliffe Dolphins. Wow. And this made me realise I wanted to be a football player. And it yeah. made me realise to grow a set of balls, actually. Because yeah. <laughs> luckily, they kicked off to the other front row. His name was Josh. I can't remember his last name. Mm. Big front row. He's a country bushy, bushy kid. Yep. <clears throat> They kicked off and Redcliffe back in the day, they were the big dogs, that old Ford pack. Yeah. They kicked off and one of their front rows just took our front row's head off. He was out cold. He was unconscious the whole time until they carried him off the field, still unconscious. <laughs> oh I remember just thinking, I'm the next run. <laughs> yeah. The bloke got sent March, got sent off the field. Yep. I'm thinking, oh crap, I'm the next run. I'm like, mm. this is the moment where you realize if you want to be a football player, mm. Put your hands in your pants, find something under there, <laughs> try and find a set of balls, have a small they are, feel them, find them, and realize that if you want this, yeah. you're going to have to make those little bad boys grow yeah. into, into some big little cashews, into some, <laughs> some decent macadamias. To go with. And that from that moment, I realized that if I want to be a footy player, this is what it's going to take. Yeah. And I took the kickoff, uh, sorry, the tap after that and mm. got stuck into it. And that was that moment where I nearly went... I don't know if footy's... Because I, I was a scared kid. I'm not a big tough. I don't want to bash yeah. people. Yeah. I'm a lover, not a fighter. But, <laughs> yeah. And I was scared every one of my NRL games. But that moment to me made me realise this is a moment where you're going to yeah. stand up and be a man. Just to bite down on your mouth guard and go, what'll be, will be. Yeah, you wouldn't know that. Go, you're a winger. So you come know, on, bro. That, did come you? on, mate. Did you, did you plenty run the ball tough, you just plenty of tough carries out of me, mate. <laughs> I, I actually, I can remember you going, can't be help us out, bro. I do a tough carry and I'm like, I'll do it for the fucking That was the bench. Boys. I was asking for water when I come on. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so you play that game and you play the whole year in Q Cup. Is that when the Broncos essentially approach you and say next year you'll be in the first grade squad? That's what I was hoping. Yep. Okay. I was like, I acted all the expectation. Wayne Bennett, I was my own manager. Yep. So Wayne Bennett pulled me in like scary as hell. Like yes. I'm a young, I was 18 years of age, mm. kid. I'm in a meeting with Wayne Bennett to discuss money and contract. Yep. I was actually on 25000 that year. I was on $7,000 to be at school. Yep. So I got paid to go to school and $25,000 mm. to live off yep. as first year out of school. Mm. And I had a job on top of that. So I'm thinking, mate, I was supposed to play Colts. I'll go in for the meeting. Go in there and Wayne Bennett sit at the table. Didn't crack a smile. Nothing. Sit down, Ben. Sat down. Look, we're in a bit of a predicament. I'm going to offer you $7,000. You won't be training full time. You can take it or leave it, but that's all this one-year deal. Take it or leave it. I remember sitting there just going, what is going on here? I'm just going, what <laughs> So a downgrade. This? Downgrade. So I got offered 7000 And there's a few boys actually signed. I think he did that to a fair few of the boys. Yeah that were in that predicament. Yeah. And uh, and some of the boys signed and stayed. Yeah, and I had that moment where I was like, same thing again, that moment I had to grab in my pants, <laughs> see what I said. And I was like, no, this isn't fair. This isn't right. Yeah. I said, Wayne, what did you expect me to do this year? What was your expectations for me? Mm. And he goes, mate, we'll do your best. I'm like, no, no, you signed me up. You told me I got to play Colts. Mm. Now I exceeded your expectations. I played Q Cup for the full year. Mm. So I exceeded all your expectations and now you want to offer me less than half my money with no opportunity and I don't swear. Like, I'm not a swearer. Yeah. This is as bad as it gets. Yeah. So I said, you know what you can do? You can grab your contract and you can shove it up your ass. <laughs> no, what I said. And my heart's racing. <laughs> but I'm like, <gasps> no. I was like, I'm crapping myself going. I'm having to stick it up to myself. And I swear that was the moment when Wayne Bennett got respect for me after yeah. that. Because then he tried to call me back and have a chat and mm. I walked out the room and luckily I had the roosters chase me. Ricky Stewart was keen for me down there and yep. they offered decent money. Mm. So actually, I only did one year playing Queensland Cup, and then um, I was down to Sydney, and down, back down up playing to... with the Roosters. Okay, so so after after that, did was it kind of like you'd made your mind up of regardless of what the Broncos say? It's not about like respect, but in a way, like you just put you offside a bit. The fact that like they were going to pull downgrade you less than half, and also not even give you opportunity. Whereas the Roosters, who who had just won or been in the two grand finals? Yeah, they two thousand was two thousand two. They won. Yeah, they won, and they they just fell short in two thousand three. I think it was. Yeah, and then they lost two thousand four to dogs. Two thousand four, all of us. Were, so I was down at the Roosters end. So yeah. most of the blokes in reserve grade were young enough to play flag the under twenties. Yeah, well, under twenties won the comp with Jamie Soward. Mm. Then all of us young kids that had a whole team that was still under twenty in reserve grade, we won the comp as well. Wow! And then all we needed was the first grade to do that as well after it, and they went down. Um, they lost that game. Was it to the doggies? The doggies won 2004. It was the doggies. Doggies won. Roosters? Yeah, yeah Asimov, okay. Masri's try. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, so that year we were down there. But the good thing is Ricky Stewart came and saw, came to Queensland and saw me, sat yeah. me down and said, opportunity, you're going to be training with the first graders. I see you as a first grader. Yeah, yeah. We're going to make you a first grader. That to belief. me, that was not, it wasn't about the money. It yeah. was more about an opportunity of someone that, I had someone that's pretty much said, 
I don't give a toss about you. Not any, I'm not even going to give you an opportunity. Yeah. I'm going to downgrade your money. I got treated like a piece of meat that time. Yeah. Right or wrong, that was the cards that Wayne played. That's part exactly of footy, right. Yeah. And, but that opportunity that Ricky gave me mm. was was one that I jumped at and Geez, I, I learned a lot down there, but geez, we had a lot of fun. Oh, roosters. mate. Yeah, I mean, I opened the, my eyes up a good chance, yeah. boy. <laughs> Early 2000s roosters. roosters is like mythical kind of stuff. When you, Within the NRL community, or players that have played first grade, everyone knows about the early 2000s, the Roosters. Train hard, <laughs> party hard. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so you get offered the, the first grade, um, essentially squad with the Roosters. Is there any session or time you remember rocking up to this first grade squad? Like... For example, was there a crazy wrestling session or crazy contact session where you started to realize, wow, this is this is first grade standard. Fitness. Fitness, wow. Ricky Stewart would find out what everyone else was doing and we'd do two, three times the amount. We were by far the fittest wow. team in the comp. Like, say you do a beep test, right? We did the beep test. Ricky's, after we finish, as we mm. finish, go to get a drink and then he's like, you weak pricks, get back on the line. We're doing it again. <laughs> this is what he said. And every beep you get less than the first time you did. So we busted our ass. Yeah, we yeah. gave it everything. <laughs> well, most of us did. <laughs> yeah. Most of us did. Every beep we got less was 100 added on to the group. So every. Oh, so if I got 13 2 on the beep test mm. and I got 13 1 the second time, I'd have cost the team having to do 1 100. No way. So I did the beep test. I think I got like 12 something. But I got like seven or eight short. So I cost the team like eight 100s. Oh, wow. It was something ridiculous. It was like yeah. 80 something 100s we had to do at the end of it. So the, our train at the time was Ronnie Palmer, mm. champion bloke. Mm. He saw Ricky, he's like, mate, we've just flogged the crap out of him twice. Yeah. And now we're about to do this. Like to do that, I mean, 80 100s would crazy. take like two hours. Yeah. People would running be crawling. at 20 second hundreds, yeah. like two is to one. So it's, people would be crawling. The backs go, the forwards go, uh, go the halfbacks go. So yeah. it's two to one. Mm. And that session, that was only one of the sessions we did. Like I'm talking, there was hundreds of sessions. Is there any were. truth? I, I heard it. I, I don't know if like who told me, but there was this, a camp or something where Ricky Stewart said to you boys, all right, boys, let's go out, have a drink. And the boys all went out and got pissed. And then they touched him up the next day. And literally woke him yeah, up in the morning and touched yep, him up. Yep. Like he said he wasn't going to do it and then flogged him. Yeah, yeah, yep, yep. <laughs> Mind games, which is what the game, when, you, when you're tired and you're fatigued, <laughs> When everything, no matter what in the game you need is fitness. Because mm. if you're not fit, you can't do anything. Your brain won't function right. Yeah. Your body won't back you up. But if mm. you're fit, and when times are tough, which are going to yeah. be when things go against you, there's yeah. repeats, set six, whatever it is, you need to have well, fitness, fitness is, underneath Fitness you. is the hard. It's the most honest thing to earn because <clears throat> it's the hardest and the most not enjoyable. But I believe it's the most important part of being a professional athlete is your fitness. Oh, 100%. Definitely. Because otherwise, when the noise, the head noise... Everything you do in life is up here in your yeah, head. Yeah, absolutely. But the noise gets louder and louder. If you've cheated taking shortcuts, that noise is ridiculous and it's yeah. unbearable. But mm. if you've never taken a shortcut, you've done everything. Mm. It's not going to be in that situation. But I'll get back to that one, that session we did. Yeah, okay. So all of us didn't make, everyone bar two people, two idiots. I won't mention their names. <laughs> two absolute <laughs> numbs. I don't swear, but they were, yeah. two of them beat their first score, oh. which showed they didn't have a go the first time. Oh, he's oh, mate, he got him. He got him. He em. pulled them in and Ricky Stewart, honestly, destroyed them he beat them and, and beat the life that? out of them saying that you weak prick yep. i asked you to do it right the first time you've clearly not yeah and that was a moment to me of realized never leave anything and you if they tell you to do something you give it a hundred percent yeah and you deal with what comes after that absolutely so, but and that, i still remember that session just oh. going on it was the hardest session in a long time i ever did yeah I'm glad i'm not those two. Oh man and it's like there is it's like a cardinal sin to lose every fitness drill and then win the last one. Remember that bloke at training? There's Bruh. that one person. Honestly. Where, where I they, think they, they should be they, dropped they, from the, the back end and they yeah. sprint the last one. Does, <sighs> it kills me. I honestly think if, if I was a coach and I saw someone do that, they'd be dropped from the squad for at least a day or two. Yeah. I, it is my pet hate. And if it's you're just a young so kid soft. coming through, that's number one rule. You Don't give everything it. from one and you They'd respect would rather you. miss you. Would exactly. rather you not make the last one. Yep. Then be missing them all and just making the we, last one. We'd rather you win all the first 10 and then be crawling in the last 10 because yep. at least we know you fucking had a dig. Whereas you come in and win in the last one, we know you fucking cut it at then. You you're fucking, a weak prick. Oh, you're weak, 100%. Yeah. That makes me so mad. Um, so you, you, you go into this environment of like this this crazy rooster side and the standards. I mean, obviously the Broncos standards would be good, but you weren't in the first grade squad yet, so you couldn't really experience it. Was 
was this was like a real eye opener for you of like wow this is the intensity of this everything the standard it was amazing yeah. and also not only did you have Ricky Stewart there you also had Gus Gould there as well who is like the Wayne Bennett of New South Wales mm. like he knows his rugby league mm. he is a smart man mm. but at the time the Roosters were the big deal they had the best players Fucking they had the nice. best forward place mm. everyone was fantastic Freddie Fitlow was towards like he Brad Fitlow his the legacy. back end of his career yep. you had Minicello you had Adrian Fitzgibbon. Morley Fitzgibbon you mm. had Crocker mm. um wingy all these guys who were incredible athletes but to me the bloke who really stood out for me was a bloke and uh adrian morley mm. incredible this bloke is the so the softest kindest lovingest best teammate you'll ever never say a mean thing about his teammate ever never always be there for your training i like, would do full contact i'd sprint at him try and run over him he'd grab me and put me down like a teddy bear gently because <laughs> he didn't want to hurt me <laughs> This is Adrian but then Morley when he go on the about. field, yeah, this did with everyone with his teammates. Like, but as soon as he goes on the field, he flicks a switch. Yeah, he's, he's known for being the quickest person sent off in the test match. Mate, he's one he of would the, kill blokes. Like he was dead set. I, I wanted. I was like, I wish I could be like you. <laughs> like this bloke was an absolute machine. But yep. he was a bloke that could flick a switch, mm. go from this really nice, humble, quiet, amazing bloke to an incredible, fierce athlete that everyone feared, and it was Mate. it was incredible. He'd be up there with one of the most feared forwards ever, I think. Honestly. Yeah. I think you'd put him up there with Gordon Tullis. Oh, definitely. Like, like definitely. you'd put him up there. No, with, you wouldn't run at him. No. Nah. No way you'd run at him. You'd Ruben Wiki, head. Gordon yeah. Tullis, Morley, they're all in their league of their own, in my opinion, and obviously a few others. Um, so you make your debut in 2005. Uh, do you remember how it happened, no, the call-up? No, I, I, I remember getting the call-up, my parents coming down, yeah. but it was all a big blur. The main thing I was thinking about is don't stuff up. Yeah. Don't cost the team. Don't let the team down. We yeah. played against the West Tigers. They actually won the comp that year. Yep. And the way I remember my first run, honestly, the hits unlike nothing else. I remember my first run, it made me realize, oh, this isn't like reserve grade. Like they hit harder. Like yeah. it, I felt, and I, the first that first game, it made me realize, oh, this is another level up yeah. and above. And it's every run. It is it's not every just run. one and run. They, they hit a lot harder. Yeah, they're There's always looking to hit. Level. Yeah, but absolutely. That, from that going on, I ended up playing eight games, then went to on, on to the Broncos. But Bronx. from that moment on. It made me realise and adapt and toughen my body up to get mm. in that situation. We lost. I lost my debut game, but yeah. had an incredible time down at the Roosters. But I played eight games in a row, and it was, yep. it was an incredible experience. And do, is there any advice that you remember anyone giving you, or do you any remember any pictures in your head of like running out and seeing Mini or you know Fitzgibbon, or and going, "Wow, this is actually happening." I just remember they were just mentally. The biggest thing I got from them is there's no excuses. Yeah, they don't blame others. Mm. You're responsible. Yeah, and, and and they don't they don't take any crap. So if I was on the field and I'm I did something being soft or weak, mm. they would pizzle you for it. Yeah, and it's rightly so. Absolutely. But I'm glad they did because that's what toughens you up. If you don't yeah. take three things you need in life to be successful, you need great leadership, great direction, and the third thing is accountability. Mm. Now they they were big on that. Is mate, you got to be accountable for all your actions, yeah. and what you're doing on that field at mm. that time. And if if you're not if you do something and you try and hide from it. You're letting the team down, and yeah. they made sure we were aware of that. Yeah, accountability is such a big one. I mean, it goes as deep as like people that, you know, let's say they've got a mate and the mate does something wrong to them. They'll blame the mate when in reality, it's, you're the one that's friends with him. Like he may have done the bad act, but you need to take accountability for it. You chose to be in his company. Everything that happens in your life is because of you. Yeah. No one else. Yeah. No one else. Bad things gonna happen. Unfair, unfair stuff's gonna happen to everyone. Yeah. But it's it. You're in that moment. Yeah. You're the one. Everything in my life has happened because of me. Yeah. No one else. Absolutely. From choices I've made. Yeah. Um. Okay. So coming back to the Broncos though, was that like how did that come about? Because obviously you left a bit like feeling undervalued. That's when. Get... That's like I said. Wayne Bennett. Wayne Bennett respected me. Yeah. Okay. When I left the room, like the next, like he was on the phone to me when I left the room and said, look. I want you to be a Bronco. I want you back here. So when your yeah, time's wow. up, I want you back here. Yeah. And we kept in contact and, and in touch. Mm. And Wayne Bennett actually called me up and said, I want you here. Mm. And I've, I've got a deal for you. I was like, awesome. And this mm. is when I was coming off contract with the the Roosters. So he said, I've two-year deal. It was 150 grand a year for two years. Mm. I was like, sweet, awesome, done deal, awesome. I had no manager. I did it myself, hung up, went and told the Roosters. Straight away, I got dropped to reserve grade. <laughs> And yeah, that was it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the year went on, finished the year off, and then all of a sudden came the end of the year. I'm like, ring Wayne up, like, hey, still waiting for that contract to sign. Like, I just assumed it was yeah, all done. Yeah. He's like, oh, sorry, Ben, I forgot about you. 
<laughs> I spent the money, the cap used oh up. Oh my god! So that's why I had to go work at the Rockley Market. So I went back to the Broncos in 2006. When we won the premiership, I was yeah. on minimum wage, fifty-two thousand oh. dollars. So I just bought my first house and investment. I just got married, just had a kid, just bought a new car. Yeah. So my life, I thought, you know, this money's coming in, and yeah. and I couldn't even afford to pay my mortgage and all the different yeah. things with the interest rates. And we're talking about a front rower. That's 19, 20 years old playing first grade. So at I'm, the Broncos. So the thing of the Void Pack there, you got Petro Simnasiva, yeah. Shane Webkey, Brad Thorne, <sighs> Tony Carroll, Sam Thiday, yeah. Dane Carlo, Corey Parker, Greg Eastwood, yeah. all these guys and the rest yeah. were at the Broncos. And I'm this kid coming through mm. at that stage. And at that moment, like I'm like, I'm not even guaranteed to be in the first grade squad. Mm. I haven't even got enough money to pay my, my mortgage. I've got enough to and I've, I've I had that moment where I wanted to feel sorry for myself. Poor yeah. old man. I was like, no, you weak prick. Yeah. You got a choice. You can man up, find another job. You need to find a way to, if you don't want to give up all this stuff, you need to do extra. So that's why I got the job at the Rock Lee Markets. No way. And I, I was thinking I got paid like $16 something an hour. Yeah. And I was up, I left my home at midnight. So I have to get up before midnight, mm. leave home at midnight on the Gold Coast. I lived at Varsity Lakes, drive to Brisbane at Rock Lee Markets, throw boxes of fruit and veg around. <laughs> And then go on and train to try and find my way into the first grade squad there. So what I did, I paired myself with Shane Webke because he was the, the Australia's best front row. Oh, mate. So I thought, if I do my fitness, skills, agility, everything with him, wrestling, tackling, and if I can show Wayne that I can mix it with him, I got bashed at the start. Mm. But by the end of the preseason, I actually was up there with him in certain things and something I was beating him, but yep. he was still bashing me a lot of. Mm. But it showed at the end of it, uh, the preseason and also the trial games, Round one, I got picked round one. And I played every game that year. I think yeah. one because I got a knee cleaned out. Mm. But I played every game of first grade that year while working a second job. And <sighs> Man, I won a comp on 50 grand a year. Like, best thing that ever happened to me because I realized, one, you don't need – like, sleep's important. But yeah. if you want something bad enough and you – you can, you, you can, your brain can make your body do anything. Mm. So it's pretty cool. And even like from a more practical perspective, I bet you any contract negotiations going forward, you're like, can I get that in writing ASAP? Oh, please? yeah. <laughs> Mate, that's my fault. It's my, I didn't know when I said yeah, yeah, And yeah. that's exactly right. But that was that moment where, man, I, I did do it tough. And there was no guarantee the second year will boost the money up. It was a one year deal at $52,000. It's just, it's just, it's strange to hear, at, you know, at the time, because like I was coming into the first grade squad. And it wasn't like you were some fringy first grader that just kind of like landed at the Broncos. Like you were a, a very exciting prop that a lot of people were talking about. So for you to be on 50K, it's just, yeah, it's, it's shocking to me. But it, obviously it all worked out. So you rock up 2006. Um, what was the preseason like? You want to talk about the Army camp, don't you? I'm just saying, you what was the preseason the like, camp. bro? That's all I'm saying. Mate, it was intense. It was awesome. And it was the first time when sports science really came into yeah, our Dean game. Benton. We got Dean Benton in. I'm not your mate. Mate, he, he, mate, he was <laughs> Oi, mate. I'm not he your was mate. like a drill sergeant. But the big thing out of that preseason mm. was definitely the Army camp, the mm. six-day camp we did where it was an SAS camp where we pretty much did what the SAS have to do yeah. to get in. And it was intense. Oh. And, ridden the next level like we didn't eat for like two nearly three days there was one oh. ration pack you shared with the whole group we had like brad thorne and corey but all these big huge guys in the like you were allowed one mouthful of food for a day and that's after running 40 kilometers and we didn't realize we we're going to be woken up every hour by and run 10 kilometers by stun grenades <laughs> but on top of that then we had to bash we had to fight each other so oh, you know people yeah. do shark bait yeah where you tackle each person in the group mm. we did that fighting not just punching kicking any wrestling and one of the drills too, they're teaching us how to kill people. Yeah. And so I get pulled out of the group. Oh my goodness, come here, grabs me in a headlock and chokes me out. I go to sleep, yeah, pass yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. I come to and I'm like, what the <laughs> hell is going on here? Like it was next level. And we had no food for two and a half days. And give mm. you an example of, we were starving. We were at the Glasshouse Mountains. We we're walking yeah. through the pine forest and we we're walking 30, 40, 50. Mm. I don't know. It was, at the time, it was just ridiculous distance. You're delirious by that stage. Mate, it was intense. And then they said, right, we're going to feed you. We did this big climb up the Glasshouse Mountains. And jerry cans. A, oh, jerry cans everywhere, pushing cars, whatever it may be. It was just horrible. But then they decided that we needed to abseil down off this cliff. And if we all did it, we'd get food. Yeah. And Greg Eastwood was scared of heights. He's like, I'm not doing it. No, not doing it. And as it, everyone was like, if you don't do it, we're pushing you off the cliff. <laughs> and we're, we're, we're eating. <laughs> so we all get down and we're high fiving. Yes, we get food. We're getting bread and cheese and coleslaw. And they said, we're getting chicken. All of a sudden, they literally just threw us two live chooks. And they weren't meat chooks. They're like laying hands. They're skinny little chooks. 
We were starving, mate. Semi thigh, they just grabs one, just <laughs> off. Brad Thorne. Brad Thorne. I've got yep. a knife. I'm skinning him because I've, I've grown up on a farm, so yeah. I didn't have time to pluck it. They and gave the, us like 10 minutes to eat it. And the we, pots they gave the us? The pots. And so we were, we had boiling water. The quickest way we could cook it was poaching them. Like, you think these little dingy little chips? They were tiny. Tiny. And I'm skinning them as quick as I could. We chuck them in the pot. We boil. And we're literally sucking it off the bone, chewing the oh. bones. Anything we could do, eat yeah. it. But looking back on it now, we should have kept them alive as pets because, mate, it was torture. Mate. The, that that six day camp but the best thing is the reason why you do these camps mm. if you're listening to this and you want to know why the hell would you go through this is they needed to break us they mm. needed to get us to a point where we were broken mm. and realized that we were done there's nothing left you know remember justin hodges jumped on day two he jumped on the back of the ute and said tear up my contract Mutiny. i'm out of here yeah. i'm done i'm out and one of the young blokes jumped up next to him i'm with him that young bloke never got seen ever again no. that was the last time i ever saw him yep, never got invited and but Hodge was obviously a big part of the team. They, I think they bribed him with because he used to smoke. Yeah, back then. so basically in our group, so he was in our group. He was like slowly gathering like people for a mutiny, and so he was saying oh, no, he was in a dark place. <laughs> he was in a dark place. So he was saying, "Boys, they, they can't treat us like." Maybe they kept going. They can't treat us like fucking dogs. And he, so his plan was, if they weren't going to like put it like take him out he was going to walk to the sunshine coast highway and just fucking hitch a ride yeah, and say i'm done because i remember him yelling at wayne tear up my contract i'm done what's this got I'm to do out. with footy dumb. Got to, yeah. <laughs> and wayne talked him off the ledge i think he got like six cigarettes a day or something to get him through it and so he's sitting on the back yeah. of the thing just starting up and, and he was also sweet we had um greg eastwood that rolled ankle so he night? would plan like we're doing orienteering at night yeah this thing we're all cooked so tired and there's bush and scrap haven't slept snakes for two days. haven't slept don't they and all of a sudden he goes down and he's first thing he goes he goes she's like i can't go in there coach he's like why can't you go i'm allergic he's like allergic to what <laughs> whatever the f is in there <laughs> but then on top of that he faked he thought how can i get out of this camp he, remember he did his ankle he yep. didn't do his ankle. he pretended he, bro he sprained his ankle yep. the bloke we played with nick kenny great the first great oh, player killer front kenny. just had his shoulder reconstructed grabs big beast with greg eastwood by like 120 kilos puts him on his shoulder on his bad shoulder carries him out like a kilometer out yeah Pulls him out thinking he's just saved his life. You know, he's done his ankle. We're going to have to send him home. Turns out he was faking an ankle injury, <laughs> hoping to get sent home. Nick Kenny's shoulder had just been operated on a couple of weeks earlier. Mate, he was filthy. Mate. But at the key is it broke us. Yeah. But then as that camp went on on day four, five, six went on, mm. we realized that we could, if we came together as a group and did everything together as a group, we could achieve anything. Absolutely. Stuff that we couldn't. And that's why we won that comp in 2006. We're the underdogs. Melbourne Storm beat us, I think, three times that year. They beat us twice that year, killed us. They towed us beat in us the trial. semi. Towed us towed in us. Trial. Oh, yeah. But then going into that grand final, we knew we were going to win that grand final mm. going into it. And it, that camp had a big part of that because we were a tight team. We knew so, that. Yeah. We knew the game plan. We bought into it. And we knew that if we stuck together as a team, mm. we could achieve anything. It's, it's really interesting, those camps, because people that you think are going to be really mentally tough, sometimes they're not. Yeah. And people that you think are quite soft – turn out to be some of the mentally most mentally tough you've ever seen it's really interesting to see because it comes down responds. to we learned from the army of that camp was mm. the fight flight and f freeze the three f's in yeah. life so the army camp people people that go you know soldiers mm. get the same training when they get out in the real field in real situation they show us live footage of something that actually happened mm over in iraq or wherever it was yeah. where they got ambushed from both ends mm. some blokes frozen just screamed in yeah. their spot and did nothing yeah. they just froze yeah got shot you see him get shot <sighs> some blokes flee they just took off and ran in the opposite direction they had no idea if those baddies there yeah. just took off and then some people instinctively just got their guns out yeah, and were firing back and talking and communicating mm. and in that situation they all got the same training but you don't know what you do in that situation till you put to that that breaking point or your life's put in danger whatever yeah. you don't know what you're gonna you really do. don't and you we really learned on that camp yeah. what we were doing a few blokes wanted to flee that <laughs> one and freeze you really don't know what you're gonna do a lot of people can talk to talk and they might train really hard in the gym or whatever you just don't know you could have the whether guy or girl you could you could look at them and be like oh there's no way they'd be tough and they get in that position and they turn into just an animal. It's a quiet one. Kill you gotta worry. I don't worry about the bloke making noise want to fight you. I'll fight him any <laughs> yeah, day of the week. Not the quiet it's one. a quiet bloke in the corner. It's like, <laughs> yeah. I ain't touching him. And that bloke, he's, he's probably rushing. I was like, they're the ones you worry about. And so, did you, um, I don't know if you remember, remember the Scotty Minto story of that camp? 
So he was wigging out day three. You know, we had to bathe in the river there and we all came out with leeches and that. Oh, yeah. yeah. So yeah. Scott Minto, to just give a context, that's like Wayne Bennett's son. <laughs> yeah. That's it, identical looking person as yeah. Wayne Bennett. Yeah. And so Scotty's wigging out. He's like, I can't sleep. I can't sleep. And he kept pestering the armies and they're like, basically, like, mate, fucking pull your head in. Rah, rah. I got to like two in the morning. He's like, I can't sleep. Like, I just can't sleep. They gave him two tablets and he took them, goes to sleep, wakes up the next morning. And then the army sergeants fucking grilled him because they were like, mate, they were fucking Panadol, like, rah, rah, it's all in your head. <gasps> no yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no way. Yeah, yeah. It's a bit, it shows you the power of the mind. That's exactly the right. The placebo effect. Yeah, um, yeah, I didn't know that. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was incredible camping. Yeah, like, that was my first in- That was my first introduction to the first grade squad. So I'm sitting there in awe of everyone. Um, but anyway, so another thing as well is Dean Benton, like, he brought in, like, we joke about the whole I'm not your mate thing. But his training that he brought in that year was incredible. Like, we were all the fittest and fastest we'd ever been. Like, yeah, it was the incredible. sports science. That's when the game, I think all clubs changed from that point onwards. And that's why we won a comp. People realized that the Broncos were doing something different. Wayne Ben actually sacked all his stuff. Yeah. They were his mates. He sacked yeah. all his mates' stuff mm. and brought in the best. That's what Wayne, ben- Wayne Bennett does really well. Is he's not the best at everything he does. Yeah, he's a great sure. man manager. He's a man manager. And what he does, he gets the best people in for the positions he needs. Mm. And that's what he did. He got Dean Benton and then a few other people in, the specialists in what they do, wrestling coach yeah. and all different uh, things. Hickman, Jeremy Hickman. Uh, Jeremy. No, so Je- Erame, but um, who was the, the K1 fighter? The UFC fighter. fighter yeah. The world champion. Um, Hazeman. Hazeman. He was a oh, mad mate. dog. Yeah. He was a crazy Remember man. Remember when but... the boys were soft and he'd just go and like, put him in the corner and just bash them? I yeah. need to toughen him up. Literally just bash. Yeah, and it might be like imagine some... all that in the workforce. Like, oh. mate, you need to improve your job. <laughs> yeah, literally, I'm toughening right, mate, him up, coach. Him <laughs> it was he was a oh. wild man, and we're talking blokes that were like 30 kilos heavier than him. He'd be like, come here, fucking twist him in a pretzel. Yeah, he put me asleep one time. <laughs> oh, yeah. mate. Um, anyway, so that during that year, did you like? Did you always? Because obviously Shane Whippy was retiring as well, and we, you know, we it was a huge thing for like the squad, but and like outside looking in like i was 18th man once but i wasn't in the squad week in week out and if you're playing reserve grade you don't get to see the inner sanctum for you guys like even though you were massive underdogs did you always have belief that you could get the job done not until i i knew we, we did a great job to get in the semi-finals that but it wasn't game. it wasn't that that bulldogs game is where things really where we really believed in each other mm. and we pulled off a miracle mm. incredible thing that went down and, and that game, it was, we were losing 20 to 4, I think it was, at half time. Mm. And people, um, Willie Mason talks about it and says, like, there's a bit misconstrued situation there, but I remember it clear as day. <laughs> he wasn't talking to us. He wasn't having a go at us. Yeah. He was talking to his team going up the tunnel. And we're, yeah. Boys, we're 40 minutes away from an effing grand final. Um, we got these effing, you know, yeah. he's talking to his team. It's but we can hear it. Exactly right. Mm. But that, our sheds, I don't even Wayne didn't say anything to us at half time. I think he said to us, there's time, boys. Yeah, well, yeah. But he knew all of us heard what was said going up that that tunnel, mm. and and that moment, and we just came out, and that that try of Sean Berrigan oh. scored, and just everyone was everyone pushed up on it. Everyone was playing every play. Mm. It wasn't like I had the first run. I'm going to get my breath to tackle the yep. next set of six. Everyone played every play. Everyone played a role in those tries that were scored. There's so many players that scored incredible tries. Mm. It was a full team try. So it was it was it was amazing. It came down that that moment for me change that season around for us where we realized we got something special here. yeah it just that, that semi-final was just incredible the way he's bounced back and berrigan's try hodjo at fullback yeah. k on the wing like you know you got darbs on his debut yourself is quite a rookie with webby up the front there what do you think grand final let's go to grand final heartbreak shane perry yeah who's the centers david Stags Stag. in the center yeah winger carmichael hunt mm. you got Hodjo at fullback. Yeah. So many players that were playing not in their normal position. Barrow was kind of a nine, but, but yeah, like... But, but Mickey Innes got injured yeah. at the beginning of the year, so he had to go there. Yeah. He was more of a centre mm. before that. So, so many players stood... The, the, the key was that no one just did what they thought they had to do. They did whatever the team required. Mm. Players were playing out of position mm. and they bought in and, and did an incredible job. So, you get to the final week. And this is essentially your second year in first grade. Mm how's the head noise are you scared are you enjoying it what are you doing the whole thing i, I wish i'd probably enjoy it a little bit more I was freaking out a lot mm. we went back to the swiss grants normally just that could you where it is but yeah in the semi-finals we stayed at the swiss grand in bondi mm. so we went back there but it was a different approach to what i did later in my career in 2015 where 2006 wayne bennett kept us very 
isolated, just us. Mm. No family members, no wives coming and seeing us, mm. nothing. It was literally just the team and what we were doing and preparing for the game. And, mate, it was a tight, awesome week, incredible mm. week. Like We went, pretty much flew back to Queensland, got our stuff and came straight back to Sydney and spent the week in there. Mm. And just that whole week, the mindset that Wayne got us in and the senior player group, and we're talking Shane Webke, Darren Lockyer, those guys. Mm. As a young kid, I believed that we were winning that match. It wasn't like I hope we win. It's, yeah. it's we got these guys, we're going to beat them. Yeah, wow. And, and that game... You know, it goes down history. We we got the job done by more than six points. I remember when I went on the field. I think we we're down at that time. I remember just thinking, "Don't stuff up. Yeah. Don't stuff. Do your job. Do everything. Make every tackle. Do every little thing right." Mm. And that moment when Darren Lockie kicked the field goal to put us six, uh, seven points in front. I'd never like the breath in and out. There's the relief. Like everyone thinks you're excited when you win or it's you relief. get in front. It's more relief. Mm. It's like, oh, it's like I can breathe again. Like yeah. it's, I've done my job, mm. and it's. It was a pretty incredible experience and feeling. It's like a you know, and I've I've just been in finals games. Obviously, I haven't been in grand final times games, but it's every second of your life you're thinking about it going into a grand final. Like it's not like you just. I mean, I'm sure there are more. As you, I'm sure you got further on in your career, there were things that you could do to identify. Like I need to take my mind off rugby league, but in that time, there was no like mental awareness or whatever. It's all you thought about. You just just in your head constantly what like was mental health when we exactly there was, there was no nothing it didn't exist yeah it didn't exist it was just you just need to toughen up yeah you know our job was to control our emotions yeah we can we can control everything that we do mm. so when we cross if i was sick i remember wayne bennett speaking to us if i was sick that week or one of my kids were up crying all night and they were sick and i had no sleep he doesn't give a toss he told mm. us straight up i don't care yeah i think all what matters is you don't bring it to work yeah. as soon as you cross that line at training you got a job to do. Yeah. Do whatever it takes, mm. whatever flags or things you need to do to get you in that moment. Mm. Whenever you came to that training paddock, you were ready to train. Same with the game. Mm. You're ready to play. And that's, I, I love that. I, mm. I could control everything in my life. I want to have power over everything I did. Mm. Bad things are going to happen to us all around us all the time. Yeah. But you can control how that affects you. Don't yeah. make excuses with it. And get on and get the job done. Yep. And so, what do you remember specific outside of the Lockyer obviously field goal? Is there anything else from the game that you remember specifically? Tight moment, a run, a tackle. Oh, I just remember just tackling my my, my gut. I try to be in every single tackle I could be because I, I Wayne spoke to me before the game said, "Look, I'm going to do something different. I want to bring you on after half time, so we've got someone fresh that can. Oh, I just want you to go a hundred miles an hour mm. for as long as you possibly can, mm. and sitting on that bench waiting and that that." back and forth and they're in front and yep. just like crap what? I remember thinking to myself how am I going to help there? like what could I do to help and yeah. the key was I learned later on in my career when I played Origin with Petrus in the Seavers I was chosen that job to do a job that no one else could do what I could do mm. everyone had their jobs they could do but I was the best person at that club to do that job mm. and I just had to nail that job whatever that was that Wayne had for me at that time yep. which I did at that, and I did my job 16 other play people did their job as well mm. which meant we got the outcome that we we were after so and so what's it like you know being a young prop at this stage and you're a part of being able to send off arguably the greatest front rower of all time shane webke the fairy tale and as you know if you've trained with webke for any period of time there is no harder trainer oh man he's he a punish wasn't he there is no hard he trainer. would kill you like he would literally to give you an idea shane webke Love him to death, but he was an arrogant prick. <laughs> Mate, he was an arrogant... He would literally... didn't. He'd love you. He'd love you, but he would still want yeah. to kill you and let you know he was the earn big your dog. Earn your stripes. You he was stripes. always the big dog. Yeah. And so to give you an idea, so I had to hold the pads. So when you're warming up for a game, at the end of doing your warm-up, whatever it is, doing the ball, running your lines, whatever it is, you've got to tackle a pad. Mm. Tackle your, your teammate. Just you go and you make good contact. So I had to hold the pad so my ribs were exposed so he'd get a good clean shot. So that meant... I'd warm him up right so he'd feel good about himself, ready to kill the opposition. So I'd then hand the pad to him and I'd get to tackle him. Yeah. What he would do, he'd get his the pad and put his elbows yeah, in behind it and lift his knees. I dead said I've never been knocked out my whole career. The closest I've ever been knocked out was literally in my warm-up so with Shane Webke. He would hit me that hard with his knees and elbows. There'd be no space to hit any. I wouldn't hit his, arm, his chest or his body. I'd hit his knee and his elbows. Yeah. And I dead set before every single game in 2006, he'd always make me hold the bat for him. I was seeing stars. So I'd be running out in the field and the only of those lights, yeah. I'd have to do an HIA to tell his game. I couldn't play the game. Just from warm up, from doing it with him in stretch sessions, he'd stretch me so much. I'd like 
about to tear some. I'm like, stop. And he'd just keep doing it. He's like, no, you weak prick. You need to go. But it taught me how to compete. And if you want to be the best, you do whatever it takes. And yeah, yeah. Here's a great example of that. And so, you, you know, you walk off the field, you look across from each other. Is there anything Wayne said or anyone said that you remember after that win? I was just a young kid. I, was, yeah. I just couldn't believe I was out there and a part mm. of it. I remember seeing Wayne and Lockyer and Wayne and, and um, uh, Shane Webke hug and embrace. And and all of our, like, we all loved each other. It's just an incredible moment. But mm. seeing the moment, because I know the, the relationship that Wayne's got with Shane was mm. something special because Shane lost his father mm. in an accident. And the stuff that they went through together, Wayne was a real mentor and a father figure for him. And the same thing I got to watch with Darius Boyd and Wayne Bennett yeah. when they won the comp with St. George. Mm. Those moments, you look back, at it's more than just a game. Like, yeah. they're shaping us to be men. And mm. that's what coaches do it's not just the way they make us into football players but the, how they make us into husbands fathers and 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 work colleagues yeah absolutely um so you win that then in 2008 you make your queensland debut what was that how do you remember the call up what yeah. was it like so the week before we played manly and do you remember i split my lip that would have been I, my i'll day. send you the photo so I you know, can see it was before. yeah I, was well, that we Suncorp? Manly. We played at Suncorp. Yeah. I ran over the, the blonde haired bloke for Manly Williams, the back row. I ran yeah. over the top of him, mm. but we head clashed Ugh. and split my lip in half, 40 something, like Ugh. completely. My lip was just hanging. <laughs> I'll send you a photo so you yeah. can put it up. On <laughs> and I had to get stitched. So I had 40 something stitches to stitch it up. And I got the phone call the next day from uh, Mal Meninga mm. saying, Congratulations, you're And I'm just like, He's like, Mate, but I heard you've had an accident. I'm like, no, I'm fine. It's all good. Sweet. It's like, well, come, we'll do the medical, mm. mate. We want you to play, blah, blah. Mm. Fantastic. Go go in there, do the medical. And they're, they're iffy about it. They're like, they wanted me to train with a helmet, like boxing helmet with the pad across the front. Oh, no. I'm like, imagine the crap I'm going to oh. cop. No, there's no way. Yeah, yeah. I refused to do it. And they kept telling me every session. I'm like, nah. Mm. Then finally, Mal went just to tease me in front of the boys. No, nah, if you don't put it on, you're not playing for Queensland. Oh. So that training session, I remember wearing it for one training session, mate. The boys were pissed. <laughs> just spray me, laughing so hard. Mm. It was a great time. And camp was with Alfie Langer and Kevy Waltz as mm. And they're the funniest people ever. And I've got 40-something stitches holding my lip together. So whenever I smiled or laughed, it started bleeding. Oof. And Alfie Langer got word of that. Oh, no. So every time we're on the bus, like, he would purposely try Like, they're always funny pricks. Yeah, but they made me it. laugh. So I'm trying to hold my lips together constantly and my, I'm just got blood dripping down my oh chin, my, down my God. neck. And they just went harder and harder and I ended up luckily playing my first game mm. for Origin. But that was one of the things I really remember the first game. But mm. two key lessons that learned from me. When I first went into camp, we did the media day. I'm like, I don't deserve to be here. I shouldn't be here. Mm. Petro Sivanasiva pulled me aside and said, mate, are you all right? And I'm like, no, I'm not, man. I'm, I'm actually... Like, I'm not sure if I'm good enough to be a guest, mate. Mm. There's a reason they picked you is because you are the best person in our state to do the job that needs to be done. They mm. picked you because you are the best to do it. Mm. Now, you need to just do that job. We don't need any more, any less, just that job for me. And it made me realize that I was ready for that opportunity. And yeah. I'll always be grateful for Petra for that chat. That he, mm. had. he probably doesn't even remember it. Yeah. But that's something that really stood out for me. And that, that, that time when we went down for my first training session and... All the I just watched Billy Slater is just an incredible athlete He's and a different breed, eh? Just the way they all train and the extras that they do. There's no coincidence why that team was so great. Yep. It's because they sacrificed so much. They did more than anyone else, mm. and they just there was no excuses. They just held each other so accountable. And mm. I was just in awe and just so lucky to be a part of it for you know five six years, whatever mm. it was. I was there. Was it was it almost like to think this young kid one of 11 at one stage you're in the back of your queue you get under a tarp getting taken to school now you're on the biggest stage like essentially every young aussie kid's dream like i understand there's other sports for sure but you can't tell me that even most afl fans know about everyone knows about origin mm. it's it's basically viewership wise the biggest sporting event in the country there might be one or two others that come close like international stuff but origin is the pinnacle of australian sport each year you're standing there on the field with a Queensland jersey on. Matt, and honestly, I don't even remember running out in the field. Yeah, I honestly, right. when you run out the field to origin, the noise that's made, and because mm. it means so much, not just to yourself. And one thing Mal Meninga did really, really well in the coaching staff is Queensland did it really tough during that 10-year period. There was droughts, there was fire, there was famine, all different things where our state mm. was struggling. Mm. And he'd fly us out to a remote town where never the team's ever been before, and we'd go out there. And we realize, we see in their eyes that no matter what hurt they're going through, what struggle, they're about to lose their farms, their animals, whatever it may be, mm. 
we switch that off for them for yeah. that week or that eight week period where we play those three games mm. they could forget all their worries in their life mm. and they could come together as one and celebrate and it was more than just a game it meant that much to queensland that it was more than just a game it was mm. something where it made us who we were as people mm. and on game day i'd go every day when everyone would have their sleep during the afternoon before the game i'd go walk queen street more with a hoodie on mm. And just go and look at the farmers and the people have driven eight nine hours to suncorp stadium to see it yeah. i'd see the families with the, the father and son and the families and i've realized that i'm not just representing myself and my family and the, mm. my teammates and my club i'm representing all these people out here and they've mm. sacrificed so much to be here mm. and it means so much to them and that's when i ran out in the field every time i honestly felt like i was going to trip up because i couldn't feel my leg here yeah, wow. the noise that comes out of that like it's it, there's nothing like it and mm. i'm forever grateful and feel blessed to be a part of it okay so uh 2008 uh obviously is win the, the origin series and won a lot of them after that too um but you signed with the the Canary bulldogs for 2009 um season how did that you know come about yeah you know this is a good story this one as well Jeez, let me know for this one <laughs> So what happened was, I'm, I'm thinking finally, because I always took pay cuts. I always wanted to be a Brisbane Bronx. I took yeah. pay cuts and they were underpaid. And there's a lot of players that came to the club that weren't playing Origin at the time. They mm. were a lot more money than me. I was mm. like, this is my time. I'm going to make money. Yeah. So I'm excited. Ivan Henjak, Wayne's gone down to Dragons. Dragons. So Ivan, I knew, loved me and all that. And he now takes over the salary cap. And then I was excited to go in for my meeting. I'm going to get some money. Yeah, baby. Oh, man. Finally got a bit, bit of coin. Oh. Going in for my meeting. I'm like going there with chest pumped up like yeah. here we go baby yeah finally go in there and he's looking at me just i remember ivan's face looking at me like there's no money <laughs> so i've just played origin i've taken pay card yeah because you know, that's just for listeners like that's what they say like they so five years before that or leading up to that they say to you take a pay cut now when the, you earn your stripes yep and when the big dogs leave you become the big when dog. When you start playing Origin, that's when you start. With, that's when you. And sneeze. that's the promise they make you. Guess what I got offered? What what deal do you think? I'm just played Origin. What do you, how much money you reckon they offered me? Well, I won't go too dramatic. Four hundred. Shut up, you idiot! That <laughs> I was, was just... the top paid at the time. That was like top wage. Fifty-two minimum wage. That's all they had left. One spot in the first grade. So minimum wage. No so the way. week before this, though, Canterbury, they got the wooden spoon. So Sonny Bill literally just yeah. was, you know, like they were bouncing. Yeah. Like they got, they were on track to get the wooden spoon. Worst team in the comp. They had all the issues with allegations with mm. players, blah, blah. I won't go into it, but mate, everyone hated the Bulldogs mm. at the time. Mm. Bloke named Toddy Greenberg. We all know who he is. Yeah, I love Toddy him. Green, yeah. Toddy Greenberg is. is he got changed. a bad rap, but I think. He I is think an incredible good. human yeah. being, man. Yeah. I love him to death. And the thing, he came up, he's the CEO of the club. He, was, he used to be of the stadium. Mm. CEO of the Bulldogs at the time came up and spoke to me about what his plans were, what they were, and how he wanted me to be a part of changing the club. And mm. you tell me whatever we need to do, and I'm going to do it. Mm. And I just thought that just words. But every week when I went to that club, he would literally ring me every week and say, what else do we need to do more? What what more can we do to help you? This is CEO ringing one of the players up. Yeah. I think he did to Mickey Innes and a few others, Brett Kamali as well. But every week he genuinely cared about us. But I had the meeting with him and I was feeling, I'm like, I'm not going to the Bulldogs, mate. You suck. I'm not going there. Mm. But he pitched it to me and it sounded pretty darn good. It sounded like what he was doing was pretty amazing. Mm. And before that meeting, I was my own manager and I went to Petro Shivan to see who was on, you know, he was the big dog. He's the best player in the best front yeah. around the comp. I said, mate, how much, how much money do you reckon I could get from him? Like, how much should I ask for? Yeah. He goes, mate, the top front rows are getting 350 a year. Yeah. I was remember going, what, that much? No, I'm not worth that. No way. He goes, yeah. mate, you're playing Origin, mate. Yeah, yeah. Ask for 350 a year. Yeah. Like, no, I can't. I can't. No, it's too much money. I can't ask for that. I'm not worth that. And I built up the courage. We're having the conversation. Go. So, what will it take for you to be a bulldog? I said, threw Petro under the bus. Petro said, "I'm worth three fifty a year, <laughs> so I'm going to need three hundred fifty thousand a year and flights for my family." He looked at me, just smiled politely, giggled under his breath, grabbed my napkin, brought it over to the table, and wrote three times three hundred and fifty thousand flights back for my family, accommodate whatever it was. Put them because will you sign it right now? I just remember going, you prick Petro, I should ask for 450 It cost me money. But I just remember, holy crap, I'm like, no, I need to go back to the Broncos now. I need to go to the Bronx and find out. And then I had that meeting with Ivan. I yeah. realized that 50, 
I couldn't get out of that meeting with Ivan quick enough. I quickly called Todd, deal, deal, done. Is the deal still on the table? Oh, deal, deal, done. I'm going, I'm coming to the Bulldogs. So that's how I went to the Bulldogs. No way. But within 12 months, we turned that club from wooden spooners, Sonny Bill walking out with yeah. a bad rap. Mm. And to give an idea also, we didn't have a sponsor that year. In 2009, no one would sponsor us. So wow. that spot on the front of the jersey is worth about $3 million. Mm. We couldn't even... We literally, we tried giving away to Camp Quality. Camp Quality said no. A charity would have got free advertising in the NRL. Said oh we don't my. want the bar to do with yet. Yeah. No. So what did Toddy Greenberg do? He paid them. I think he paid him like $200,000 to be on our jersey. We paid someone to be our sponsor. No we paid someone. Who does that? Yeah. Wow. Then, by the end of the year, J-Car, I think, took that spot and yep. paid like $2 million or $3 million, yep. whatever it was. Mm. But by the end of the year, we took them from Wooden Spoon to equal minor premiers at the end of the year. Mm. And the Bulldogs, the fans were back. They were doing the right... Like The fans were incredible. I loved the Bulldogs fans. They mm. were amazing. Yep. They were lovely, lo nice people. But that year, we took them from nothing, from the crap house to the penthouse. Yeah, wow. Because like, it's one thing to go into a good squad and win premierships or minor premierships but it's another thing to change just a club's trajectory into something great but that was a great for myself michael Innes, brett Kamali, josh morris um the big thing for us was we the key is to be great we had to be the difference mm. we had to set the benchmark so mm. i didn't have a shane webb or a yeah. petro or a darren lockyer mm. i then had to be a senior player i mm. had to then and andrew ryan had to do it too general had to do it and all of us bought into you know a, a situation where everyone rose off everyone thought well we'll favor us to be wooden spooners mm. mate we killed it that year and that year we had things like five players got the the daly and player of the year for their position okay wow which is never heard of and the coach yeah. of the, the coach of the year hooker of the year front row of the year back row of the year center of the year who was your coach and, that year uh kevin moore oh kevin bullfrog son yeah because so what so desi has when they're 11 12 uh, i think it's 11 or 12 yeah. yeah um okay so you make also the australian side that year as well what would like how did that come about oh mate it was it's just oh sorry just before i forget i was also offered fifty thousand, fifty two thousand dollars from yeah. Ivan and jack yeah that yeah, same that's year, like, yeah, yeah. mate got no money can't offer you a rah rah yeah. plus there's no spots with all the money was yep, spent, yeah plus so you won't be in the top 25 you 52 grand so you're worse than me i thought i had it man. Uh, yeah but i mean you're origin player i was bloody still i mean i was playing a role but i'm an origin player um and yeah so 52 grand and also your third you're our third string winger so he had stevie and darbs in uh he had stevie and darius in front of me but darius hadn't left yet yeah well, that's uh, what kills you though that's what kills you I just want the opportunity. No opportunity when you see when a, a coach closes that door and says there's no opportunity that's the part of your dice. Like it's I, like, mate, I would have stayed like for twenty five. You lose your confidence. You don't. Yeah. I would have stayed for twenty five grand. If he yeah. said you're on the wing. Yep. Yeah. I would well, have stayed. I for want you. Grand. I want you to be at your best on the wing. Yeah. You 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 give your life for it. You that's just, what you do. Sweet. I mean, that's what happened with Wayne. Like again, I so I made my debut. Like he played extremely well, two thousand seven. Like all that kind of stuff. And Wayne, once again, no money, mate. But obviously, like you know, when the big dogs go, we'll give you the money. Rah rah. And I promise you, you'll start on the wing this next year. And then it rolled around. I didn't start the wing. You started someone else to come up. Reese Robinson, yeah. halfway through oh, the preseason. Man. I eventually get it. I got in like the two games in. But again, these are all things I guess a lot of the fans may not hear is like, yeah. you know, you're an origin player getting off at 52 grand. Like craziness. Yeah. And no, you've already done the hard yards. That's, that, that's just the way it is. Yeah. And there's players that took that money in. Like 52 grand. Like people can't live off that now. Like that's. Yeah. And you bust your butt. Like my body's wrecked. And the stuff and also, we like, through, yeah like people that go oh 52 grand that's the average wage or whatever but like you are not an average employee you are an employee you are an nrl player top you're in the top 0.1 percent or whatever of a a business that generates billions of dollars so you should be compensated but the key is it's your lifespan too how yeah. long is the average life Absolutely. expectancy oh, uh, a career of an nrl player mm. Back when I was playing, it was 52 games. Yeah, about 50 games. So two years. So the yeah. average person plays in the NRL is only two years. Yeah. And you got to make hay while the sun shines. Yeah, so absolutely. give me an idea. Yeah. Put it in much. perspective. Um, okay. So yeah. Two so you, you make your debut for Australia. Do you remember the call? Do you remember how it all come together? I don't remember too much because I was just enjoying my mm. just enjoying life. I had mm. an incredible wife and kids and I was loving my footy and things were going great. I won Dalian Prop of the Year. I had no idea it was coming, mm. but when I got the phone call, I'm like, I can't believe it. Like, I'm I'm going to go tour England, yep. France, in a foreign nation. And prop of the year. I mean, that's amazing. And I, I actually wasn't going. To, I said, no, I'm not going. No and way. I got a phone call saying, because I thought, 
no, nah, Fooey Fooey was going to win it yeah. that year. I knew it would be tight, but like I don't give a toss about the awards. Yeah. Like it's doesn't really bother me. And my wife was heavily pregnant. Mm. I'm like, nah. I'm what year pregnant. wasn't she heavily pregnant? Bro? Yeah, you're correct. <laughs> but and she actually passed out at the ceremony because there was a stand up ceremony no, for no most way. of it, and she was all wearing high heels and had to embarrass and put her down and sit. Nothing going on here. But anyway. Oh wow. But I went to it because I said I'm not going. And they kept going. No, you have to go. I'm like, I'm not going. I don't want to go. Mm. They said you have to. And I found out they told me I was going to win. So yeah, I knew wow. before it was. Yeah. So I had to go to it, but. Was in, and that experience, to give you an idea what the man Toddy Greenberg and Kevin Moore at the Bulldogs were, mm. how much they cared about us, what they did for us players, we didn't know about it. The wives of the CEO and the coach got all our wives and girlfriends, mm. took them out, got their hair done, got their makeup, got them dresses, jewelry no to borrow, everything for the Dally yeah. and pampered our girls because they know how much we do on the field, but they also understood the sacrifice that our partners did for us Absolutely. and made them feel special. And every time it was their birthday, there was always a present and a card handed to them by, by, from the CEO or the CEO's wife. Wow. Or every, so they cared about our wives, our yeah. kids, and it was Cause pretty such a, special. You know, when you're younger, you, you, you don't really understand how much, you know, a professional footy player, you know, the wife essentially has to focus on him in, a se in the sense of like, 100%. It's such an extreme sport, and if you've got children as well, she can't afford to chase her dreams. She just doesn't have the time. Because... And a great footballer is an even better woman by oh, him. One hundred percent. Creating a, a good home environment for him to come and release his stresses, because like the anxiety of being a footy player is just so crazy. Because you're just constantly worried, constantly worried. Anyway, so the Bulldogs that year, do you remember putting on the green and gold though? Surely you remember the green and gold. Yeah, and I was actually I was disappointed. No. no, not putting on like we're playing amazing, but I thought Origin is so intense. We're in the training room, yeah. like you can hear a pin drop. It's so calm mm. and so serious. I thought I was back at the Mudge Bar Redbacks <laughs> in like some like it's cold, it's dingy. Playing some yeah. of the games in some of the stadiums, mm. getting dressed, the boys telling jokes and just chilling. Get okay, we're going to have a test match now. Cool. Yeah. No, it was way. that sort of feeling. It yeah, was wow. it was incredible. The footy, like the players, everything was amazing. Training. But I remember getting ready for it. Like the intensity for Origin was mm. way more for Origin, in my experience, than it was for Australia. Mm. But it was it was so much fun. Like we're buying fireworks and BB guns and doing yep. all different shenanigans. Like we just ran a muck for eight weeks over in England, and France. And so, was your biggest win the forty six to sixteen uh, over England? Was was that your biggest win over there? Or you can't remember. Oh, remember. <laughs> no, but we we won the final, and yep. I remember I had a moment where i thought i killed someone <laughs> no i ran we had a head collision off a kickoff i knocked him out oh. and he was unconscious still when they took him off and i actually kept asking the trainers is he alive like has he come to is he yeah because man I, he was not even snoring like he looked dead well yeah. it was just a head clash oh thank god but this is how tough the pommy pricks are mm. literally my next run someone just took head on <laughs> like to get me back but like i didn't yeah. mean to get like yeah, yeah it was yeah. just a head clash mm. but it was pretty cool like yeah the, how tough it and semi burgess that year like that was the year semi burgess really broke out mm. i think he scored two got two tries in the final of the mm. four nations and i swapped jerseys with him after the match and i just remember going this kid is gonna be something special in our game oh was he special oh. jesus um okay and then you sign a four-year deal to return to the broncos did you finally get the deal you deserve got some decent coin and the reason why i came back too people don't really know this i kept it quiet because i was embarrassed mm. my oldest son at the time was doing it really tough oh really now so my oldest son is on the spectrum mm. he's on the asd spectrum mm. and we didn't know at the time we had we just thought at times he's a naughty kid we didn't know he's having meltdowns and but they got that bad and this is what people don't realize like us footy players are normal human beings like everyone yeah. else my son was going to every training sessions with me because mm. if he stayed home with mum he would bash mum and try and kill himself wow it got to that point so much where it was a good day when he'd tell us that we're talking a five and six year old kid wow where he said, this world doesn't make sense. I don't want to be here anymore. Oh my God. And there was a good day when he would grab a knife and try it. Like when we're around, it was a bad day. And this is where it got really bad. I knew I needed to get home and get help from family and get diagnosis yeah. and get some real help was when everything was going fine during the day and you just get a feeling, go check on your son. Mm. And he'd be up in the room, in his room. You'd think he'd just be playing in his room with a plastic bag over his head with electrical tape. He's blue, nearly unconscious. Oh my God. That's the point bro. where we were at, where I was like, something's not right i need help oh my i remember going God. to the ceo and i was even scared to tell the ceo i was like we need to go home mm. but i didn't know how to tell him because i was like i was embarrassed i'm like there's nothing wrong with my son my son's amazing yeah i think my son's but i don't want anyone to know that there's something wrong or... yeah yeah 
But it's just like someone with a heart condition might need it or diabetes need dialysis. Yeah. My son just needs a tablet a day just to, to keep him at a certain level. Yeah. But he also needs the tools to cope with certain situations. And if yeah. anyone knows who have kids on the ASD spectrum, mm. when that when things get really tough and they have meltdowns, they need to have a process in play that they can understand to bring themselves back to normality, to be back and functioning properly yeah, without wow. having a meltdown. So we had Luckily, I was getting paid half decent money. I could pay it. It was like about fifty grand a year. It cost me wow. to each year to to get the help I needed. Yeah, but I needed to be home around family because my son was literally and Kevin Moore, the coach of the Bulldogs. I'll be forever grateful because he would let me have my son in video sessions oh, where he's wow. going through game plan. I've got my little son on my knee at training. So every training session, he'd be out in the training paddock with me, running wow. around. Wow. Like we're, we're first grade footy team. Yeah. He let me because he knew I needed it. I needed that help. Yeah, wow. And that's the reason why I looked to, to break my contract to get home. And I know mm. there'll be a lot of Bulldogs people that were like were filthy that I left. Mm. But I was too scared to tell people what was going on because I wanted people to think my life was perfect. Yeah. There's nothing wrong. There isn't anything. Mm. There's bad things that happen to everyone. Everyone has crosses they got to bear. Mm. But as a parent, my wife was at the point every day she was calling me crying hysterically. Yeah. I don't know what to do. I'm a bad mother. I mm. don't know what to do. I can't do this anymore. Fine. And as a husband, what do you do? Yeah. I'm in that situation. How can you help? I want to help my mm. wife. I've got to still go to work. I've got to yeah. put money in. Mm. How can we needed professional help? Yeah. And I was so grateful for the club for allowing me to go back home and get that help. And yeah. I was lucky I was playing good enough footy that the Titans and the Broncos wanted me mm. and they offered decent coin. I was able to go back and get the help we needed and it's, go it's, back to the Bronx. You know, obviously I'm not a parent, but I would assume it's also like a very protective instinct to not want to tell, you know, that your son has problems because you're so protective of him. So it's almost a vulnerable, it feels like it's a vulnerability. Well, if you, in footy, you understand that if you say anything in front of the footy, you'd be vulnerable to the footy group. Mm. Back in the day, you get sprayed for oh, it. Like, yeah. mate, they, they would own that. That would be their crutch. That yeah. If they needed to go to the drug dealer to bring you down, <laughs> they'd bring that up. Yeah. And I didn't want to ever put my family in that situation. Mm. I, I, didn't, I didn't think they'd do it, but I just didn't want people to know about... I was ashamed, actually. It's probably the word to do, which is mm. not right and not... But that's just how I felt yeah. at the time. And mm. I didn't want the people to know fully my problems. But now I realise there are so many families that are going through the same things I was where... I didn't see any light at the tunnel. Mm. I honestly thought I was going to bury my son. Yeah, genuinely yeah. thought, I knew if we didn't get help, we would. Yeah. But I genuinely thought I'm not going to have my son for much longer. And so in that he, moment, I knew we needed help. And I didn't right. see light. Yeah. didn't happen overnight. It probably took three three to four years yeah, I was going to have to before ask. he was at a point where people, that by that this stage, when she learned the tools and was on the right medication, all the mm. things, now people don't even know. People yeah, don't yeah. even know that he's even got on the spectrum and... And so he's doing like so it, well. He, he, he's got a job. He's yeah. still at school. He's wow. doing all the right things, and you know it's it's a credit to him for doing the hard work and learning the tools. That yeah, you don't make excuses. Things are going to happen to you. Mm. Life's going to be tough. Everyone's going to have different hardships in their life. Mm. He learned the tools to cope with that and make himself better, and that, mm. and that makes me more proud of him more than my footy career. I'm more proud of him than I'm myself. Yeah, wow. Well, I mean, it's just a credit to you and your wife for you know making that tough call of like we need to we need help we need to go home get help from professionals our family you know as we always struggle with it as men is like to ask for help it's almost it makes you feel a bit like oh i don't want to bother anyone i don't want to be that guy but i mean yeah just well it is our role to watch over to protect our family yeah. and it's on us so for me in that moment i thought i need to fix this it, mm. but I've, it took me a while probably took me nearly 12 months to realize this is out of my depth. I can't fix this. Yeah. I need professional help. Mm. And when that finally came, my wife came to that conclusion six months earlier, mm. but I didn't want, I was like, no, no, we've got this. We can push through this. Yeah, yeah. But it's, it's like it's like me, a football player, someone asked me to give heart surgery. I ain't the man. I can give it a go, Yeah, but, but I ain't going to fix it. Yeah, I need yeah. someone who's specialized in that to do that. Yeah, and so he's doing fine now. He's, he's doing great. Yeah, that's so good to hear, bro. So yeah. good to I've hear. I've actually got three kids on the spectrum now. So really? Three of my kids. People wouldn't even know, but we've learned the tools to cope with certain situations. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and that's, I, I wouldn't change it because as much as it can be hard at times, certain mm. things, they got gifts and, and it, there's a lot of strengths along that come with it as well. Yeah. So it's like anything, you, you turn lemons into lemonade mm, it's a beautiful way to look at it man it really is because that can bog you down constantly thinking about oh why me or why this happen and and uh to look at it in the positive of like they've got things that they can do that other people can't do to a degree mm. um no that's awesome man okay so you get back to the broncos 
Um, you missed part of the uh, first uh, 2011 uh, with a calf injury, but you returned against the Titans um, in like man of the match form against your former club, uh, the Doggies, I think. Um, and you were also selected again for, to play for Australia and Queensland, like to just just fall back in. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. just to just to continue this form. What was it? But to be honest, that was the beginning of my downfall. Oh, now, really? I'll be, I'll be honest with you. Like, mm. it wasn't my downfall. My biggest mistake in my footy career, man, and in life in general, and mm. this is a big thing that I want you to learn from my mistakes if you mm. listen to this, mm. is I went back and my focus was all my family, which it needed to be, was mm. getting my son the help he needed and making sure my family was right. But the big thing I told myself in my head was I'm at the top. I just need to, I need to maintain what I'm keep maintaining. Don't don't take shortcuts. Keep maintaining what I'm doing. Mm. Now maintaining is the biggest mistake you can make in your life. Mm. Trying to keep doing just what you're doing means you're going backwards. If you try and stay at the level you are, it's like a mountain. You're eventually just going to come down. Mm. You have to constantly be climbing that mountain. And I was doing all the right things of training. I was winning fitness. I was doing lifting heavy weights. Yeah. I was doing the extras, all the things I did needed to do. But I tried to just stay at the level that I was at. And that's the biggest mistake that I, if I could take my time over and do again, is that time in my life when I was so focused on my family, I told myself, I made an excuse. Mm. And I'm filthy at myself because I'm, I'm a weak prick for doing it. Mm. I made the excuse of, I just, I just need to keep doing what I'm doing. Mm. Don't just keep doing what you're doing. Mm. In life, you have to continue to improve and better yourself. Because mm. that's if you don't do that, you're going backwards. That's when you start getting anxiety, mental health, or all mm. those different things. If you want to be happy in life, you need to keep progressing. And the mm. only way to do that is hard work. Yeah, it's so true. Like... Maintaining is going backwards in any extra, any that's, professional That's legit. The biggest thing, when I go back to that time, I could blame things and coaches, whatever it is. I can make. I go back to myself and I'm, I remember what I was doing, the things I told myself, and that was. And I've still played for Australia for a couple of years. Yeah. I played Origin a few more years after that. Mm. But there's young kids coming through. There's always like at the beginning when I said, "There's no one better than you. You're no better than anyone else." Mm. There's always someone with more talent coming through if you're not willing to keep in progressing yours mm. people go past you yeah okay so that's also when hook took over and you know like towards the end it seemed like you weren't really in favor with hook towards no. the end of your contract what was that like that, that time under a new coach in, in Anthony yeah, Griffin? I don't want to bag him because I've said some stuff in the past and I regret saying stuff that could have hurt his feelings or you know could have been taken the wrong way I, I think he is an incredible man mm. I think he's a fantastic husband father all those things mm. but from the day I just didn't feel that he rated me and wanted me to be a part that's how I felt mm. that could be me feeling sorry for myself whatever it is but mm. I went from playing longer minutes and doing all these things then my time got cut those young kids coming through that he coached Josh McGuire and them coming through he was the under 20s Broncos coach yeah. so but there was it, just, it just seemed like I tried to continue. It was one of those things I tried to please, like the kid trying to impress his parents, mm. but I'd never be the favorite son. Mm. That's, just, that's how it felt. Mm. could be completely wrong or whatever it may have felt for him. Mm. But I tried everything to hit his targets and all those different things. But I, I think his eyes were somewhere else. He, mm. he didn't rate me to be the player that I thought I was mm. or what I could be or what I, I was doing. But mm. that's... His team, at the end of the day, it's his team. Yeah. And, and it's, I understand yeah. that. And that, that he has to live and die by the team he picks. Mm. And, you know, we, we had some good success as well. I still played for Australia and all the different things. But at the time, I learned a lot about myself. I was making excuses and blaming him for certain things and mm. situations. And that's not fair. Because yeah. once I'm older now and I've sat back and I look back at my career, everything in my life is because of what I've done. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I can change certain situations by what I want to do. So yeah. I'm not going to bag him. Are we, are we best friends? No. Have I called him? No. Has he called me? No. But I, I respect him. Mm. I respect him and what he's doing. He's never given up. He's still coaching. He's still doing his best. Yeah. But we just weren't each other's cup of tea. And yeah. I wish him all the best. And I'm, I'm sure if you asked him, he probably wishes the same for me. Yeah. Oh, for sure. For sure. And, and like, you know, I was under hook as well. And I got that same feeling of like, he just didn't seem to rate me as highly as some of the players that he'd coached before it's all part of footy i guess some coaches love you some coaches have a different vision and, and you gotta is. realize as a player you, you got a bit of an ego and yeah. it's, it's your part of the team I, i'm gonna help this team mm. but at the end of the day it's not our team mm. we're just filling in we're we're holders of that jersey for that week for that yeah. year whatever it may be mm. at the end of that it's, it's that coach's team yeah it's he's he lives and dies if they ain't winning who gets sacked yeah he gets sacked yep. straight away on the spot mm. so it's one thing I learned along the way. And so how did the, the Cowboys... I mean, look, talk about timing, bro. 
<laughs> Come on. Tom, what do you mean? They couldn't win without me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you, you sign with the... Um, the Cowboys for yeah, two thousand massive coin, huge coin, uh, huge coin, mate. Finally got your deal, mate. Huge pay cut, huge pay. Like it just, <laughs> I was on great money at the Broncos, yeah. but yeah, it, it made me realise that, mate, it doesn't last forever. Footy, and yeah. you need like it's as quick as it come, as quick as it go. Yeah, there's an opportunity. I could go to two clubs as either the Cowboys or the Melbourne Storm. Oh really? And I weighed up the two. Where could I win a comp? And both I'm wow. like, I could win a comp at both. And the, comp, the Melbourne Storm won the the year after. Yeah. So I think I could win at both. And I was like. I'm on crap money though. If I took six, I had six kids at the time. If I took six, six kids to Melbourne, how much would rent be? <laughs> I started doing the maths. I'm like, I can't afford to live on the money that they want. Like, <laughs> yeah. I'd have to be homeless with my kids. So, oh. Cowboys, you can build a five bedroom house with aircon in every room, oh, TV in every room, right. 400 bucks a week with yeah. a swimming pool, and they'll maintain yeah. and it. And you're a lawns. king. You're living like a king. Oh. <laughs> so, I went up to the Cowboys. Yeah. And so, you go up to the Cowboys, and again, what was that like? A lot of people consider this the greatest fit grand final of all time. I was there. I was in the crowd. I was talking shit because I thought the I thought we had this. Yeah, you're layering up. I yeah, was layering yeah. up, yep. and I'm not known to layer up. <laughs> Big bug. Sorry. Um, and so, like, I thought the Broncos had control of that game. They did. They did. They did. Um, and and a lot of people think this is the greatest grand final of all time. First ever all Queensland final. That season, you know, you could also argue it, it, it cemented Thurston in immortality to a degree. Maybe yeah. you will, maybe you won't. Do you remember that season, though? If you look back, look at the, how many games we were losing at the start mm. of the game and how we came back. Yeah. Nearly every game we were in that year, they would get, we would never start, I never come off the bench. I never got on the field when we were up. Like it was very rare. We were constantly started slow mm. and then we built. And then at the end of the game, the last 10, 20 minutes, we would just find a way to win. We mm. all believed in each other and we never gave up. Yeah. And that's exactly in the grand final. I've heard someone say this and I stand by this. You don't win grand finals. Mm. You lose grand finals. Yeah. The Broncos lost that grand they final. Did. Did. You don't win them. Both teams have the, the, the squad to win it. Yeah. Both teams have the game plan. That's otherwise they wouldn't be there. Mm. They've got the, the leadership, the direction, the accountability. Everything is in set. Mm. They both believe they're going to win it. So both teams are going to win that game. Mm. Someone will make a mistake. Someone will shut up shop early. Yeah. Someone will try and take it in their own hands and win the game and not do the team thing. All these little things add up. Mm. And that's exactly what happened. The Broncos shut up shop early. And yeah. They were my teammates. I feel for them because they had that game won and they decided yeah. it's a club game. It's not a grand final. We're just going to run down the clock. Yeah. But the incredible plays, not just what Kyle Felt did at the end and also Michael Morgan. Like, mm. Michael Morgan is left-handed. Yeah. He went across the field on the right side, put in the right hand, try flicking the ball out with your non-dominant hand. <laughs> no way I'd final. have the balls to do that, no let alone way. the skill set and, and fed it to... It's one of the most underrated grand final plays of all time. Like, but, it doesn't get talked about enough. But what he did was incredible. But before that, Milford made a break. The game's over. They're winning. He yeah. makes a break and nearly scores. Mm. Kyle Felt knocks the ball out. Oh, and we yeah. get the ball back. The game's over. Yeah. Cole Felt is an absolute hero in my books. Like yeah. He is the man. He had like three or four huge plays in that game. The mm. kick as well. Mm. A couple others as well at the back end of the game that changed the game for us. Mm. Also, James Tarmel, that quick play the ball. Mm. But JT had an eternity to kick that field goal. Yeah, it's true. So like so many key moments of that game, which mm. really stands out. And I think that's why it will go down as the greatest grand final. Ravs has already said it. It's the greatest game he's ever called. He's and incredible. To be there on the field, I'm, you know, I'm not a crier on the field, but that game was, man, I couldn't hold the emotions in the, the feelings of how long it took me and the hardship I went through the four years at the Bronx and mm. then finally getting back up there at that stage and showing what I could do was it was pretty special. What do you remember specifically from the... Were you on the field when he kicked the field goal? No, I, I came... I was off at the end there. Yeah. I was standing behind him when he kicked... Not the field goal. When he kicked... the, the When we scored to go to, to level it up. Yep. I didn't watch where he, the ball... I was watching where he struck struck, struck the, the ball. ball. Yeah. He struck that so clean and pure and beautiful. I was <laughs> celebrating as it hit his foot. But he hit it too good. It went too fast. Yeah. He didn't have time to come back around like mm. it always does. Yeah. It hit so high up the post still on the way up. He kicked it too good. Mm. That he missed it. I remember that moment going, can't, the emotion was up and then yeah. it was down. And then yeah. when we won the, the, when we kicked off, I knew we had every opportunity. Mm. When Benny Hunt dropped the ball, I knew the game was done. Really? I knew that you just it was feel done. It. I just knew, I said the six there with the, with Jason Tamalo and James Tamal, who can get a quick play the ball for JT. Mm. The game was done. It was it. like, it was, it was one of those eerie moments where you, the you could feel fate had been sealed. If you know what I mean? Like, and that's, 
like obviously it's devastating to see Benny Hunt that that situation. Oh yeah. But it was almost like fate was against him in that moment. Like it was it was the moment for Thurston to etch his name in history forever. And also the rest of the Cowboys boys. No disrespect to anyone else on that team. But obviously Thurston's such a superstar. Um but is there anything during the game you remember, like being gassed or big yeah, hits? Or... No, nah, there's a moment that I'll never forget. <laughs> and my mate brings it up and bags me over it. Is when J, I think JT drops the ball, mm. drops the ball, and you never get beaten on your inside shoulder. And so, like, I make sure I'm covering that. Matt Gillette picks the ball up. Mm. Just knock on, like, we had the ball knock on and just went to make Matt Gillette curls up and, like, goes down and compresses himself. So I go to hit him. I hit him, but I bounce him through the hole. And they scored the try instead of six. <laughs> and I think we're, I was just like, no. Like, I don't, like, my big thing is I'd make sure I do my best never to miss a tackle. Like, mm. my job is rock solid. Yeah. But I remember when Jack, Matt Gillette bounced off me. He's so hard to tackle, Joe. He's, he's, he's mong strong and mm. awkward. Like, he put himself in a weird position where, like, it should have been a scrum, but mm. they picked the ball up. Like, mm. we should have just jumped on it with a jump, but they yeah. picked the ball up and quickly passed it. Mm. I think either it was Matt Gillette or Reedy scored straight away. That that play they scored. Mm. And I felt like I cost us. The, that moment, like that whole year I worked so hard in that one moment, I gave it everything. But I just called myself every name under the sun. Like, <laughs> you weak. Like, yeah. I just remember that. Like, if that if we lost the game, yeah. I would never forgive myself for that moment. And all the great things they did in the game and the amazing stuff, I don't remember. It's mm. funny. You only remember yeah, the, the bad, bad things stuff. you do in life. And that's... Yeah. In everything, you're constantly, when life's so bad, you've got depression or anxiety, you're constantly thinking of the worst situations. Mm. If you show gratitude of all the good things you've done or achieved, it, but as humans, we don't do that. We constantly, we really my don't. mind in the grand final, I still am thinking like, I nearly cost us the grand yeah, final because I scored off a missed tackle of mine. Yeah. But it was, yeah, it's funny you bring that up because that's, that's what I think. You can't change the way I feel. But yeah, yeah. That's the one thing that really stands out for me. What, what I, I let down the team. And so you, you win. You're part of New Th- no, North Queensland's first ever premiership. What's the feeling like after? What's the chat like on the field? You will never know. <laughs> unbelievable. Oh, that was incredible. Like the teams do it now as well. As mm. you're with the team and your family, it's amazing. But then everyone leaves, and it's just mm. you and the trophy. You go out in the field. The boys have a beer and. Mm. And do all that, and you sit there, and the music's playing. It's just incredible. You, you can breathe. It's excitement. It's all the great things. Mm. But then it's as because I'm older, I'm, I'm I think I'm 30 years of age now. Mm. I'm just turned 30. I'm about to turn 30, and it's the partying after. We've got the keys to city to Townsville. We've got the keys to city to Mackay. <laughs> keys to city to, to Cairns. We've got the keys to city for Charters Tower. Mm. Pretty much everywhere. Mm. Like. You could just do what, Every and then want. and then we went to Vegas as well. And oh, what happens wow. in Vegas will ever always stay in Vegas. <laughs> but mate, it was just a special, special moment. We had a moment where it was like um, the Hangover, where we had like a WhatsApp group, mm. and mate, the stuff that was going, it was just an incredible time together. Yeah. But then the cool thing was at the end of the airport, we all got it together. And we all went through it, laughed about everything together, yeah. and then we all pressed delete. Oh, yeah, really? you're nice, And nice. it all got deleted, so none of it will ever yep. exist. It's all up here with Never just happened. us, boys. No one will know. Yep. And those moments, not just what we did that year, the way we celebrated, it was just a perfect year. What a, what a you know, for yourself to win your second premiership, like you had a different club. Now, I don't want to brag, Kempi, but this is the moment where I've done something that no one's ever done in the NRL. And what is it? And I'm going to brag about this. Hey, brag about it, baby. That's my turn to brag and feel I'm the only person ever in the history of the NRL to ever win a comp with two Queensland teams. Oh, shit. Only one in history. That's crazy. I popped the cherry. No one else has That's done it. That's it. No, it's going to see, it's going to have Ben Hunnett's name there, the first ever. So, to win 06 two- with the Bronx and the Cowboys. You should come out of retirement and win one with the Titans. I reckon you could do it. Uh, Oh, there's a bit of time for that one. <laughs> <laughs> no. Could you imagine if you did win all three with the Queensland sides? You'd no, go down to bloody history royalty. Um, okay, yeah. So you, you obviously have that incredible um, game, uh, incredible win, the grand final. And then basically, so you retired 2016? Yeah, at the end of 16, we got beaten by the Sharks Yep. in the major semifinals to make the grand final. We nearly went back-to-back, and the Sharks oh, went man. on to win it. Yeah, yeah. They demoralized us up there in Cowboys Stadium. Yeah, because didn't you tell them up earlier in the year, and they, they came back the with The year Avengers. before, we, to make the grand final, we smashed them. We put, like, four, like yep. we brutally destroyed them. Mm. They did the same. They remembered it, and they they brought that up that week. Yeah. And Because I remember speaking to Groover, Luke yeah. Lewis, about it. 
And he's like, mate, they were like, it was, it was revenge. Yeah. And it was. Yeah. And it sort of kills me because I never got to say goodbye to the fans after a game and, you know, do the, the, the farewell lap or mm. anything like that. But in a way it was probably good because I, I, I love the game. It's given me everything. Mm. And I'm, I still play now. I still play in the Legends games. I still play local fun footy because I, the game's made me who I am. Yeah. And then I've told myself I'm going to keep playing and having fun until my body will no longer do it, till mm. I physically can't do it. Mm. Because it still gives me the same joy if I'm playing at first grade, park level, old boys, whatever it is, I still get those good feelings I get. Mm. And it puts me in situations where my brain gets to a point where I miss that yeah. from when I was playing. Now, tell us about your boxing debut, Benny. Oh, mate, don't you? Know, Come I'm not on. a boxer. You're a boxer, yeah. mate. No, I'm not. Oh, uh, mate, you're, 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 you know what? No, you are a fighter. I'll tell you that right now. You're a fighter. You can take a punch. Yeah, you can yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. No, well, this is this is something because I saw it on Instagram. I always I always heard about people doing boxing. I'm like, I wonder if I could do that. Yeah. Do you reckon I, I think I could do that? <laughs> and then it came to the time with Josh Papali, or Papali, sorry, mm, yeah. where no one would fight him. No one would no fight one him. They couldn't get anyone him. to fight him. Yeah. And I remember just like it was like a couple of it was like a week of constant on the Instagram. All I could see was no one would fight him, and I was like, I could do it. <laughs> and I thought that I was like. I sent a mess like on ha ha jokey face. I'll do it. Ha ha ha. Yeah, yeah. The phone rang within like five minutes. No way. As soon as I wrote it on, on a message under one of the things, like yeah. I'll, I'll I'll do it like jokey face. Like, yeah. And I was like, Ugh. okay. And they rang me up. Would you seriously do it? And I sort of thought, about like, yeah, I guess yeah. so. And then I, it didn't really hit me who I was actually fighting and what yeah. was going on. Because I heard all the stories. He boxed as a young kid and all the different things. He definitely and, boxed before. Yeah, like he's a... But also, no, he's Polynesian, so he's a power athlete. Yeah. And I'm a, I'm a, I'm a diesel engine. I'll You're go all day. So I, it might, I've never boxed in my life. And you've got to get Chris Walker on because Chris Walker came to my first ever boxing session. Yeah. The only person I knew that could box was Michael Katsidis, yeah. who I went to watch Chris Walker do a session. I didn't even train. I just watched him. Yeah. And Michael was there. So I sort of just rung Michael up like, can you teach me how to box? <laughs> it's like, okay. First how many ever weeks out was this? This four weeks before the fight, never put on gloves in my life. No idea what a wrap was. Didn't know you put wraps on before you put gloves on. Yeah. First ever. You training. would have only done the conditioning on the shitty gloves at footy. That's, That's it. it. That's not it. Even not even gloves. like, yeah. and I was still. It's not. Yeah. I couldn't even hit the bag. Yeah. Couldn't even hit the pads properly. Yeah. But anyway, first training session, Chris Walker comes. He's a champion bloke. We've been mates. He came to my wedding, all that sort of yeah. stuff. He comes to session and doing got me straight in. It's like four weeks. You just need to start sparring. You need to learn how to take a punch and keep your eyes open. Yeah. Okay. I'll do it. Chris Walker comes around. I'm doing a round with Chris Walker, and Chris Walker's tinker me. And all. and after the training session, after doing rounds with all these different people, Chris Walker pulled me aside, put his arm around me, and goes, Mate, I'm worried about you. <laughs> he goes, You can't do this. <laughs> You're going to get killed. You don't got it. You're not ready for this. You can't do this. I'm like, yeah. I'm big. And if someone tells me I can't do something, yeah, I'm like, yeah. I feel as I can do this. Yep, yep. So I'm like, Okay. All right. Thanks, mate. I appreciate it. I didn't say anything. I just said, uh, Thanks, mate. I'll, I'll, I'll think about it. Mm. And I went, I just I tried twice a day, every day, fitness, mm. boxing. I sparred every day and I was going mm. to other people's gyms, people who could fight, and they were punching the crap out of me. <laughs> and I just, it made me, and I, but the thing is, I learned I could, I could take a punch. Yeah. <laughs> but I just learned, and then one week later, this is only one week in, Chris yeah. Walker came to the same session again. Mm. And he came in after some rounds from some people. He came in and I learned how to, look, I learned quickly. Yeah. I learned a few things. Mm. And I started tanking him no and way he actually put his head up, I'm out I'm done he goes you can fight now you're, <laughs> you're good you're good to go and so one of my best mates is a bloke named Will Nazio mm. Wild Bill he's a, he was heavyweight yep. champ for, for Australia yeah. the Tongan fellow and we go to church together and he's got five brothers mm. and so I just got him and his brothers to spar me so I, he weighed 135 kilos he's, all these brothers weighed 135 140 kilos and they can all fight Yeah, yeah. so I just do rounds with all of them they're Tongan big and so the big thing is, though, is I know that if I could whether the, if I could push and pressure them, if I'm throwing punches, they're not going to throw punches back. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember the the weigh in with Josh Papali as well because I remember I, I was in half decent shape because mm. I did a 12 week challenge before that. I was down to 100. I weighed in after breakfast. I went and had big breakfast. I weighed 101 kilos. Wow. He starved himself and yeah. wasn't drinking water to dehydrate, and him and um, Junior Paulo and all them were doing that. They were starving for the weigh. -in. He weighed one hundred nineteen point eight, like no way, twenty kilos on me. And then when he, when we went into the ring, so when the music played, and I came out first, and <laughs> I remember coming out just going, 
Oh God. What are you doing? <laughs> What are you doing? You shouldn't be doing this. Like, why are you doing this? In my head, the whole time as the music's playing, it was just head noise going. Yeah. Can you get out of this? Can, is there a way to? I uh, came out. I'm like, I'm like, ah, uh, cool, man. I remember in my head, like, just try like cool, just block out the noise. And then his song starts playing, Big Papa. Yeah. Oh, and he came out. He looked like a different after the weigh-in because he could eat and drink and Big. he looked ginormous. <laughs> I just remember going. And it was that moment again, like, are you sure you want to do this? And I'm yeah. like, I remember just telling myself, you can't back out now. Yeah, you're here. You're in the ring. You should have done a Greg Eastwood. You can't back out now. You should have rolled your ankle, bros. And that moment, and I just thought, and I, I looked at, and I, I was crapping my dax. And I actually mm. looked across to my wife. Mm. And this is the incredible human being she is. Mm. is she's made me who I am today. And mm. I want to give her a rap. Is everything, I wouldn't be in my footy career without her. Mm. She's made me to be accountable for everything in my life, be honest and try my hardest to, to be the best I can be. Mm. I looked across at her. I could see the way she was looking at me was mm. like, she was scared and that, but she, she like, she had my back. Yeah. And, and proud like, as well. I'm I'd never going to let her down. Yeah. And I'm not going to embarrass my wife. And I'm trying to teach kids on the spectrum too. I've got three kids on the ASD spectrum mm. where life seems impossible. So everything I've been doing since I've retired, I've done Ironman in Germany, I've done marathons. Mm. And this is another example of fighting is, I got told I was going to get knocked out in 30 seconds. I yeah. wouldn't go the distance. There's no way I'd go around with him. Mm. Everyone's saying I'm getting knocked out and my kids are hearing this. Yeah. They're scared. They're saying, Dad, don't do it. My mm. wife's saying, you don't do it. But I'm going to try, I've got to try and teach my next generation to be f fearless. And if people, people can say what they want. They mm. don't have a say in your outcome. Only you do. Yeah. And I looked at my wife and said, I'm not going to embarrass you tonight. Yeah. And I went in there and the rest was history. Look, like, I was very unlucky not to win. Like he didn't hold his hand. He said I didn't win the fight. Ben did, and mm. I get a hundred percent will respect him forever and love him forever because mm. he's just an honest man. And yeah. he saw it how it was. Yeah, and it was it was an incredible experience. Mate, I mean, it's such a good showing for you. Like I was shocked. I I knew you're you a fighter. Off, mate. I no, I did there. not. How dare you, sir? What do you mean no? I've uh, never fought in my life. Oh no, I I fought over the buffet. No, that was it. I, I knew you were getting the hey, final line for buffet. Omelette. I knew you were a fighter. As in, when I say fighter, I mean a bloke that doesn't back down from fucking anything. That's what I mean when I say fighter. I don't mean actually technically a boxer. So I knew that you were never gonna let the moment defeat you. And I just think I'll never that, quit. I'll yeah, never give never up. Never quit. Like yeah. never, ever, ever. But I was surprised at how technically, like obviously you still got heaps, like a long way to go. But like technically, for a guy that just put on gloves, you should have been disgraceful. Like you mm. should have been not able to hold your hands up. Well, I couldn't the first week. Four weeks. That's four weeks of <laughs> yep. training. And yep. I trained hard. I Trust me, I trained three times harder than he ever trained. Mm. I promise you that. And what's crazy is like he has trained boxing before. He's in his prime as an athlete. But it's different when you're getting hit in real life. <laughs> it's different. <laughs> Very There's different. There's nowhere to hide in footy. And this is what, I, what gave me confidence. Is mm. no one runs at him. If I look in the defensive line, I'm, I'm not, not going to run at Papa Lee. No way. He'll kill me. <laughs> Penny has to make 10 tackles a game because people aren't going back there. No, they don't want to go. But in a boxing there. ring, if someone press you, you can't rely on your teammates to make your tackle. Mm. It's only you. Mm. So if I'm throwing and I'm, even if I'm spent and I'm still throwing, mm. he's got no one to block him. Mm. It's only him. If he's tired and he can't hold his arms up. Yeah. And that's what gave me confidence knowing he's a power athlete. Yeah. I'm a distance athlete. That's we've, but just our makeup's different. We yeah. can never change that. Mm. One punch, he would kill me. Yeah, yeah. But 100 punches from me, I'll eventually knock the, yeah. the tree down. That's the mindset I had. Yeah, just going to get try to outlast to a degree. Mm. Um, okay, so you do that. And it was, an, as I said, incredible showing. And it's so good from both of you as well. The way you both carried yourself after it, the respect you showed each other. Um, then you get a call to fight the great Gallon. Yeah. How did that come about? Well... First was was the Hodjo one. They needed short notice for Hodjo. I was a mess. I was I put on heaps of weight, mm. and, and I tried to learn to box. I thought because I've done it once, I'm, I'm a boxer now. Yeah, I'm, yeah. And I tried to box. It's the worst thing I could ever do. Mm. The Gallum fight was the best thing ever because I realised I can't box. Yeah, fight. I don't need to box. I need to learn how to throw a punch. I went down to Jeff Fenix and he taught me how to throw a proper punch. In one, yeah. I had one session with him and it was incredible. And he's yeah. just a, the craziest, amazing human being lives an incredible mm. life. I learned so much that one day with him down there in Sydney. But the thing is, I knew he was a, he's a diesel engine as well like me. We we're going to go nonstop. But people didn't know this before the fight. I was still playing park footy. Mm. So my last game of park footy. So I agreed to do the fight. I had five week notice to do the fight. I said no like five times. Is this times. Gal or Hodge? Gal, Gal. Gal, Gal. Yeah. So I got five weeks notice and I said, no, 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 no. And mm. they kept putting the money up, which is fantastic. And so they should have, mate. We put on a fair spectacle. Yeah. 
And my wife, it came to the point, I didn't make the decision, my wife did, because when she saw the messages coming through and it got to a point, it's like, <laughs> we're building a house. We're, we're not going to house. We could actually, that, that would actually pay for a pool bag. I was like, so what are you saying? You want, you're telling me not to do it. Now you want, you want me to do it. She's like, it would help. And I'm like, all right, we're doing it. So that's, she was, she was, the reason I took that fight was because my wife, she actually, yeah. you know, we've got a family. It help, helped out a lot. Um, husband, we have a family of feed. Yeah. Get out there. Son. And we want to pull. <laughs> so yeah, you're getting out there and fighting. But the thing is I played park footy and I was the last game I played just at about just after half time, a couple of big forwards picked me up and dumped me on my side and I broke three ribs. Oh no. But I didn't know I broke. I thought it was just rib cartilage. Yeah. I thought I'll be all right soon. But I couldn't sleep. I couldn't lie down on my yeah. back, my side, my I literally for two weeks slept sitting up on the couch. Yeah. Wow. I couldn't sleep. I oh, literally I'm like God. Look at the fight. I could see the days counting down to the yeah. fight. It's five-week notice. Mm. I didn't tell Georgie or any of the boys at No mm. Limit because I knew they'd pull me out of the fight and I wouldn't get yep. paid. Like, and when I agreed to do something, I'd never pull out. Yeah, That's yeah. why I got eight kids. <laughs> so I agreed to do something in my life. I agreed to do something. I'll give you my word. I'm, I'm your man. I'm going to yeah. do it for you mm. with everything I do. So I'm, after two weeks, my wife's like, you need to get an x-ray. You need to find out. I'm like, I don't want an x-ray because it just show it's If it yeah. doesn't show it's it broken, I look like a big... Yeah. A big... And it doesn't like change sore. anything. It's it, sore, yeah, it's but, sore. But if it, if it doesn't show it's I look like an idiot. I've carried yeah. it for no reason. Yeah. So I went... They got an x-ray in a, a CT scan. So my mate got, got the scans done. Yeah. And it was clear as day. Both ribs, uh, 10, 11 on the side are completely snapped in half. Yeah. They weren't just formed, but they were a little bit out of place. But... Yeah. Rib number nine at my back. So not only did it break the side, it blew the, my back rib out and pushed oh. it in towards my, I don't know what it is, yeah. your, your lung or your kidney. Oh, I don't right know what no. it is. But anyway, it's like two mil away from, if I had a big knot, it would end up doing that. Probably probably punch your lung. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, one of those things. Anyway, so finally it got to a point, I couldn't even run for the mm. first two weeks. So I couldn't do oh, anything. Yeah. I was just eating clean. I was like, I am just can't eat. I'm just yeah. trying to get weight off, get fit. Mm. And then I finally could start running. I started running every day. I was going to the gym every morning before work. So I did breakfast radio. So I was going to the gym at 4 a.m., running 5K and then yep. sparring my mate Will Nazio, Wild Bill, every morning. He can fight. So yeah. every morning yep. he came and, and sparred champion. me. Yeah, <clears throat> sparred me constantly. And it came to the point where he's like, we're not going to teach you how to box. Like, you guys, mm, nothing I can no do. Time. We're just going to give you a couple of tools that you can pull out of the bag and, and use this when you need it. Mm. But if you're thrown, he's not thrown. So the key is he has to block if you're thrown. Mm. And so we completely changed. I didn't. I only trained twice with a proper boxing gym. I trained wow. every morning with Will Nazio, mm. and I went to no. Um, I went to Platinum Boxing Narang with Chris, only twice for that fight. And Chris came and helped me out in the night. He's an incredible coach, but mm. he knew I, you can't teach someone to box in that yeah. sort of manner. So of time. You, your focus was just pure cardio, like just go. Just get us fixed. I knew he was fit, and yeah. I was out of shape. Like I only had, and I wasn't in the best shape. Mm. So. If I get into some decent shape this year, you never know. I might get back in the ring oh, again. But, he's well, got a bit of taste, eh? Well, I thought I did a decent job. Hey, where, buddy, where there wasn't much between the two of us, and his face looked a lot more. Like, I thought he he looked not the he worse to wear. He yeah. got a lot, he got a lot more points on me. I know he won on points, whatever yeah. it may be, but we went the distance. And if he's mm. one of the best fighters in in the country, and he's an incredible athlete, like I love Paul Gallen. He's someone I just mentally tough. He's incredible. Yeah. So yeah. if I can match it somewhat with mm. him we'll see i think you did all right i think you did all right mate for the, the amount of training you've done incredible well, Kempi, you and me we're both in radio maybe you know we're both in me and podcasts you and media. maybe you mean you know, i don't want to hurt you benny i don't actually i don't right. want to hurt you mate i don't want to hurt that beak, <laughs> that beak is, this is a money maker bro. Listed, you're trying to right, fucking ruin me career what's, the, what's it, the eighth one in the world <laughs> oh man it was eighth and ninth it's so big um mate i ask all the boys this favorite rapper of all time you're a rap man uh eminem 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 come Joe? on Come on, Eminem. Yeah, I know, I know. Just, just the, the the cards were against him, mate. Everyone wrote him off. Yeah. You know, he's he didn't fit the narrative, mm. but he loved it, and he didn't give a toss when anyone thought. Yeah. And realistically, name a rapper that's better than him. Yeah, it's, he's name the a rapper goat. that's better than him. Yeah, it's a goat. He's a goat. Period. Uh, favorite movie of all time. Oh, you're gonna hate me. Oh, really? You want to know this? Yeah. Titanic. No, I like that. I'm a big softy man. No, I love love as nah, well, bro. And when I was younger, we had a VCR player. That's the only video we had, and. For a young boy, there's a couple of scenes in that, that really changed me. And, and just, I'm, I'm, I've got a big heart. Like I'm a lover. Like I fall in love easy. I'm yeah. a lover. Yeah. And you know, in that big moment, teddy bear, big polar bear. You no, know, it's. You know, I love a love story. So I'm guilty. <laughs> Mate, I love love too, bro. Got a bit of Jack in me. Everyone's got a bit of Jack in them, bro. Everyone's got a bit. There's always room on that door too, wasn't it? For two. That bitch. But, <laughs> 
can't believe she did it. Selfish. <laughs> I know. Um, and uh, if everything happens perfectly in the next 12 months, mm -hmm. where are you and what are you doing? Don't care as long as I'm with my wife and my kids. Oh, he's Don't a family care. man. No, nah, right? honestly, look, it's a there's truth. nothing stop. I, I believe for you and mm. everyone. Nothing stopped me from achieving whatever I want. Yeah. No one's me. Mm. So whatever I want to do, I know I'm going to get after it and get yeah. it. But the best thing is, as long as I've got my wife and kids with me, mm. that my true happiness in life is not my footy career. It's not radio. It's not. It's every day when I go home and see my kids and mm. and hugging and kissing them and seeing them achieve. And, and I'm going to see, I can see they're going to be do great things in our world. Yeah. And be great leaders and great workers and husbands and wives. And mm. that what, that's what genuinely, I know it's yeah. probably a little deep for you, but that's, no, I love it. That's what makes me happy. Yeah. No, that's awesome, mate. What an incredible career. Thank you so much for coming on, Benny. I appreciate it. Anytime, Kempi. Love you, mate.